Welcome to today's Tourist Development uh, Council meeting. And without further ado, I would, do you want to take the roll, Stacy, or do we have a quorum? I think we do. Okay. Uh, may I have, I'm going to move the chair's comments down to at, at the last thing after board member comments today, if that's all right with all of you. And let's move right into the approval of the minutes. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Very good. Any opposed? And do we have public comments, Stacy? No. No public comments. Well, look at us moving right along. Uh, Barry Burton, please come forward and give the update on the raise. Good morning, everyone. So um, you heard a little bit about this uh, new uh, proposal that is uh, developing um, the, gas, the former gas plant district and the Rays um, uh, deal. So, you know, this started obviously a long time ago uh, with Mayor Welch releasing a new RFP for the gas plant district. There were a lot of component pieces that we've been working on for the last year and a half, almost two years. Um, but one of the component pieces that involved us is the stadium, okay, and whether the tourist development funds could be used to, um, as part of the overall deal to um, make the deal happen. There's two component pieces. There's 18 to 20 acres that comprise the stadium portion and <clears throat> there then the rest of the deal. We tried to stay only on the stadium Portion because the other involved city assets, infrastructure, um, and, and, and the whole Heinz portion of that development. So the things I'm talking to you about refer just to the stadium portion. They're interplayed because it's all one infrastructure project, but there's four phases of development. The first, uh, the, the piece that we're, that we're concerned about, obviously, is the stadium. So the proposal right now is a term sheet. And this is what I briefed the commissioners on um, last. Now, obviously, I've been briefing commissioners throughout this process. Um, but the, we really tried to get down to a point where both the city, the county, and the team felt that we had a structure where we could announce that we have a deal. Okay? But it is not by any means done. We spent an hour and a half the other day talking about the documents that need to be completed and negotiated and be done by March, and my heart sunk. I was like, I've got another job to do here, folks. Um, you know, But there's a lot of component pieces to this that have yet to be done. So this is a non-binding term sheet. Um, it, 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 it outlines the general structure. There are a lot of component pieces that have yet to be completed. Okay, so the general idea is that the um, site comprises 17 to 20 acres. Uh, it um, is a uh, term sheet that is comprised of the city of um, St. Petersburg, the Ray Stadium entity to be determined, um, and the county. The uh, general framework is that the county, for the portions that you're interested in, um, would would First off, the city will act as all financial conduit. So we will have an inter local agreement with the city that will reimburse our portion of that. But any debt issuance, um, anything like that is will be done by the city. That makes it easier because they've got to work on both sides of the deal. They also have to manage the in-town CRA, which is component pieces to both uh, the, the stadium development and also the rest of the uh, 86 acres. So the new stadium project proposed budget is 1.3 billion. Um, yes, with a B. Um, so a lot of money. However, you know that that the raise will cover any cost overruns. So the so the amounts that I'm going to go through with you are capped for the public portion of the deal. The city contributes 287 million 500 thousand. Um, as part of that, 
the county contributes $312,500,000. That gets you to the $600 million. The county then gets back $25 million through a um, um, refund over 25 years. So in essence, it's a partnership with us and the city at 287.5. Okay. The, um, we also um, um, agree to provide any residual left in the in-town CRA. It's estimated to be about 28 million based upon current projects. Any residual left in the CRA can go towards the project. However, it, do, it will not increase the current county cap of the CRA, which is at 108 million. So we had agreed many years ago, way before this project, to the in-town CRA. It had a cap of 108 million. That will not change. But if there's any residual left, it can go to development because, in fact, the in-town CRA was designed for the redevelopment of that area. Okay, and so that that is a component piece to this. That'll have to be worked out how we do that, um, and if there's any language, you know, modifications that are needed. Um, the city will issue the debt. <clears throat> the uh, to go, uh, all of this will go into a construction trust fund, and the reason that's important is it's, it's dollar in. So we're not putting dollars in until the team puts dollars in, right? Um, and so it's a, it, it, and that'll be controlled through a construction trust fund uh, that'll be managed um, by the city. The terms of the agreement, um, <clears throat> it's exclusively responsible, the, the team is responsible for all maintenance an upkeep on the stadium in perpetuity. So that's, they're gonna fully fund up the CapEx. Um, so it, in essence, it caps our liability uh, to the debt service um, on the um, stadium itself. Um, then there's other pieces that are pertinent to the city about insurance and uh, so the team's taking over insurance. It used to be on the city. The team is taking on the responsibility for uh, daytime, daytime security outside, you know, external road security. Um, the team will reimburse the city $400,000 for that. That used to be on the city. Um, <clears throat> there's use days, so it, uh, that we, but we give out, um, there, so there's use days for the city and things like that, but there, we also give out, um, um, I think it's, I forget the amount of tickets, but 5,000 tickets to um, 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 underserved uh, uh, kids and it's anywhere in Pinellas County. So, <clears throat> um, let's see. Um, we do that. <clears throat> in addition to the city suite, which has been um, historic, we also will have a county suite that'll be assigned to CBB. Okay, so we can use that for marketing, for um, we have visitors in. We can use for economic development and a variety of of things like that. That that I think will enhance. Um, it'll enhance your relationship with us and the Rays. We already spend a lot. They already do a lot for marketing with the Rays. This new destination is going to be something completely different. That'll be a whole new marketing effort that we can partner with them. It just builds that relationship. Um, let's see. There's non-relocation agreements um, and the commit to play the home games there. Um, and... That is a very quick summary um, of the overall um, stadium deal. I would be happy to answer any and all questions. Questions? Bill? <clears throat> Just a comment I discussed it with Barry earlier. Uh, as some of you may remember when we did the Tropicana Field uh, deal, we gave them a percent or one of the percents I think it was the fourth penny at that time. And uh, he assured me that it's a flat amount. We're not going to be doing a particular amount of our TDC funds that keeps rising and growing and growing. So that's one thing I just wanted to make everybody aware of, that uh, he is aware of that. It's going to be a, that, that fixed amount. Um, I have a question on the uh, other events that will take place besides the – is that the Rays going to manage all that? And they are. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of component pieces. This. First off, you're – you know, I'm not going into all the sausage – that got us here, um, I can assure you the ask was far greater, um, you know, and things like, um, you know, percentages and ongoing upkeep and all the things that you see in some of these stadium deals, 
you know, we hired Inner Circle Sports, us and the city combined. So when we spoke, we spoke with one voice. Um, and, and that's been invaluable because I, we also know every major league deal that's been done in the last 10 years and the structure of some of those. Um, and the CapEx cost is a major, major component, and it, it, and it only goes up. Um, so capping our liability and our exposure was a key part of, of, of what we wanted to accomplish out of, out of this deal. So it is fixed. Um, <clears throat> we can make a decision on if we want to put money down. Well, a lot of that will be dependent upon the outcome of our Corps of Engineer beach issues. Um, and we can have that discussion at a later time once we know more. Um, but yes, we've, you know, we've, we've kept that. Um, it's not a percentage. Um, the second part of your question was? The other events. The other events. You know, if you look, so we did, a, we also did a um, economic impact. And it, not just game day, but non-game day events are, are huge. Um, and that will have a tremendous impact on tourism. People coming in for events, staying in hotel stays. Um, so the non-game day events are going to um, significantly increase as a result of this uh, deal and, and this stadium. It's going to be designed in a way to where it covers more of a 24/7. Um, it's going to have um, a, a you know plaza style to where there's other things going on. Um, so it'll be a, it'll be a natural draw, and I think it'll just enhance tourism uh, throughout. One other comment about property taxes. Uh, the stadium itself, okay, so, so the overall, um, it's, it's estimated to $6 billion um, of total investment in the uh, 86 acres. Um, uh, the stadium itself will be tax exempt. It'll be owned by the county, okay, at least back to the city, um, and then managed by the Rays. The, but the other portions of the development, we did not extend the CRA, so the CRA uh, ends in 2030, and the and again that is already capped at, and we're not increasing that amount. So that'll go on the tax rolls, um, and so you know you could say 4.7 billion if you minus the two, but a lot of that's public infrastructure and things like that. But it's over two billion dollars in new EAV, um, and probably you know more like you know three or three and a half. So, um, but it's at least two. Um, in new EAV going on the tax rolls. And that will then gen come back to help support um, and keep our taxes low as we have that growth. And again, uh, so it's very positive from an economic development standpoint. Largest economic development project's ever been done here. And, and, I, and I truly believe that, that um, th that'll have not only an impact on the EAV and new taxes, but on sales tax, on bed tax, and, you know, and down the line. Mike. Thank you, Madam Chair. Barry, um, uh, capacity of the stadium? Uh, 30,000. It's going to be a much smaller, um, really push you right up to the fans, you know, and uh, um, so it'll be a very intimate um, stadium. But there'll be open areas. Um, so the stadium design, you've seen the designs. Um, it's pretty cool. You know, it will be a, a dome. It'll, be a, it'll have a roof structure, but the sides can open. And so you can, on nice days, open it up, have that airflow, have that natural feel. Um, and but it's a it's a smaller stadium, but it'll work very well for all for uh, other events also. Taylor Swift concerts. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think she'll pack out any stadium right now. But <laughs> two of those. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Gerdes, and then uh, come. Up. Mayor Bojowski. Just to add to that, it's 35,000 on non-game days. There you go, 5,000 standing room. And then the way it's supposed to be set up is the field, the, the field stadium will be separate from like meeting spaces and convention areas, so you could actually split it off um, and, and have smaller events. Right now you can't do that in Tropicana. You gotta open up the entire thing to have an event there, so. And, and, and to go into uh, that comment, for instance, it depending upon the hotel com, um, that ends up being with it, it, it could be a component piece to that hotel, and it may or may not be connected. And so there's some real opportunities uh, for synergies in you know that convention kind of space that that we've been missing, um, you know, in, in kind of a larger mid-sized convention. Um, so. 
but that's yet to be determined. One of the things I, I've said on this, people say, you know, oh my gosh, they're going to have this and this and this. Well, yes, you are. You're going to have that component piece, but you can probably count on the first phase, but things will change over time. They'll build what's in the market at that time, you know, and, you know, so uh, 15, 20 years is a long time. So. One last thing. Commissioner Gertis, did you have anything That's else? Nice Mayor Bojowski. Well, I just wanted to thank you and your team for working through this. We're very happy that the Rays are staying here. And I wanted to know if you had any clue as to when construction will start. Uh, it, it'll start as, we can, as soon as we can get the documents done. The idea is that it'll be, it's open for the 28 baseball season. And okay. so they've awesome. got to get going in earnest. And awesome. there's several phases to this because it's that's the reason we wanted to simplify this with just the city because you, you've got to have parking facilities when you take parking out for the current operations. And so there's there's several different phases of it. But the idea is that, that it would be the the hope is that they can be done by the 28 baseball season. Uh, Russ? Um, <clears throat> I'd like to also add to the mayor's uh, uh, voice and saying thank you to the city and the county for negotiating and uh, fixed numbers and, and having this stay with the race staying in Pinellas County. Uh, I lived through the first time and uh, went back and forth and I was a hotelier that had a property in Clearwater and one in St. Pete that we redid at the time and um, we lost it. And we lost it because it was 10 years later, we spent the money the city and county did to build a stadium and we didn't have a team for 10 years. And today, with what's happening in St. Pete, with the growth and everything, as you read in the newspaper, but also, I think the deal that you've done and with the city and all is right on where we are. I'd like to, to also uh, tell you that the reason why we went to 1% tax is because it was during the time when bonds were rising like crazy. And so we tried to protect our industry by saying, okay, we're going to give you one penny towards a new bond issue in uh, refinancing. And that covered the refinancing. But then after that, bonds went down. So it made us look bad. But we saved money in the meantime. And, and we had to live with it the rest of the time. But thank you. I think it's so good to have the Ray staying in, in uh, our county. Thank you. Commissioner Prather. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've got a few. Um, it leads into infrastructure you talked about, and it's it's difficult. Um, how are we going to do that? I know we're capped, so it almost doesn't make any difference. But of of the costs that you've talked about, um, all that infrastructure work, can you give us a breakdown of what we're, are we taking 25 percent? Are we going to do a pro form of what, uh, a pro rat of what uh, the costs are? We're not, we're not paying anything for infrastructure. So there's, so as part of the original in-town CRA, we committed to 75 million uh, for the infrastructure. And so that's capped. Um, and so then that additional 28, that may be a residual of the CRA, that again is controlled and managed by the city, has to be in compliance with the CRA approved by the commission. Um, that's it. And then there are other parts of the deal, Commissioner Gertis could, could discuss it greater than me, but where the city, and the, and, and the Heinz Development Group have infrastructure requirements. And I think there's $130 million back in infrastructure and other pieces, but you can probably answer that better than I. Is it okay if I answer? Absolutely, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the city has committed $130 million. Uh, I think the bonding phase is four phases over four, uh, it's four phases, I can't remember over how many years, and we're capped at 130. Currently today, we're anticipating infrastructure costs to be somewhere in between 180 and 200 million, but uh, the city is capped at 130, and the Rays would be on the hook. Rays Hines would be on the hook for the rest. Um, my next one is is parking. Um, can you talk a little about that? There was um, first, there's a parking garage which is needed both for um, the part of the development which is not what we're dealing with the Heinz portion for the office building and retail as well as parking for the for the Rays. There was also a discussion of at, at various points of taking out either 175 or 375. Is that still part of the plan? Is that going to make it more difficult for people to get into the parking garage? So 
Uh, to my knowledge, there's no discussion it's not been about any more discussion. The, the highway. I mean, okay. there's been talk about, there's other issues associated with but that's not part of this development okay. deal. The, um, as part of the development, they do have a 2,500 uh, space garage that is adjacent, but I think there's another garage. There's that's two garages in phase one as a part of, yes. as a part of the 18 to 20 acres. Yeah. Two garages. I, I can't remember exactly how many parking spaces, but that, that, that number sounds about right. 14,000 spaces over the entire development. And so, when, so that's, that's a key to the phase. Like they're going to build one parking garage before they start development of the stadium because right. they're going to, because when you build the stadium, you're going to be taking <coughs> out parking. So you've got to have, you know, parking for the current operations for three years. So, so that's part of that phase development. Again, <coughs> that's we're we're focused around and, and our funding is going for the stadium, you know, component only. That's part of the larger redevelopment that is really kind of on the city side. Thank you. <coughs> if there's nobody else, I'll go. Uh, uh, I, I just also wanted to, Barry, thank you and the team. I know I've been getting updates for a long time now, and uh, I know that this has been a labor of love and how much work you have put into it. And I know, um, you know, every time I got an update from city administration, city administration talked about how Barry was really fighting hard for the county and for the TDC. And I just appreciate that very much, Barry. And uh, I know all the hard work you and your team have put into this. Um, there was one thing I, I wanted to mention, uh, Barry, I don't know if you wanna mention it or if, or if Brian, but I think one thing that's in, at least important here is the on-site, um, like visit St. Pete Clearwater presence in the new stadium. I think that's something different than what we have today, and I thought it was worth mentioning. It, it, it actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. It is part of this, and that was an important piece. Um, and that is, uh, I'll, I'll read you the wording, but um, beginning with the 2024, not, not 28, 24 season, the owner and the county through Visit um, St. Pete Clearwater will work towards a separate co-branding um, agreement to join to promote the team. Beginning, we, oh, I'm sorry, I had the other thing. We'll also have a physical presence at the stadium. Um, let's see, a use agreement. We'll have a physical presence, the stadium, stadium signage, and an information center um, at street accessible level. So something to that effect. So we have to work that out, but the, but the, we're gonna have a presence of, of our brand there, not only on signage, but in physical location for us to use and to market and use that at our, at our pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I, th I thought that was an, an important part and something new that I, I thought was really cool and um, innovative uh, for us to think about. But otherwise, uh, Barry, Ryan, team, thank you so much. Thank you for all the hard work and it keeps going now. So, uh, but that's all I had. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tropicana Field uh, currently hosts all the graduate or a majority of the graduations in Pinellas County. Is that still going to happen? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, and there's and there's use days and things like that that will be part of the city. There's there's a lot of component pieces uh, with the city's agreement. Um, and again, ours is for is a, a use agreement with the city, um, but there's a broader you know aspect with the city and use of the stadium. Okay, and so far I've I've not seen a name for the new stadium. Is anyone even discussing that yet? No. <laughs> we, yeah, no is the easy answer. Naming rights, um, again, as a part of the deal, are, were solely to the raise. And so um, I, I would anticipate that, obviously, later in this process as, as they get closer. But there's been no talk uh, as, of, as of yet. And to kind of on that point, just to kind of give you a little bit of the sausage making, I mean, th there's you know, you, you put a couple of years at everything that's been thrown out there, you should have done this, should have done that. Believe me, we thought about it. We started out with naming rights. We started out with ticket taxes. We started out with parking fees. We started out, and, and you, you look at and you study the way teams have managed through those with cities around the country, um, and simpler is better because then <laughs> games get played and articles getting written about how they got around the naming rights split um, and through separate marketing agreements, and all of a sudden the city's not, you know, or the county's not getting their money. So we worked through a lot of different areas. This made it clean. 
It was a partnership. Everybody gave, um, and and I think overall it it'll be a it'll it'll have a much better outcome, long term in terms of that partnership. And I, and I just think to Barry's point, keeping it very simple to where stadium is operated and ran by the Rays, and so things like insurance, capex expenditures. I mean, insurance alone this year was just short of nine hundred thousand dollars. We're estimating that'll be four million dollars under the new stadium. You can say those things. I can't. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, the, so those things having passed those on while giving up, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of naming rights share. The, the, those were kind of the things that kept this deal a little bit more simple. Commissioner Henderson. One final. <clears throat> I too commend you and your team for getting it done. And you know I've talked to you personally about it, but I want to make it uh, public that uh, I apologize for the TDC BCC meeting where I called the question and said, "How much?" And a week later, you know, if, it, if the timing had been a little different, it would have been a lot different. But yeah. Everybody knows my concern for beach nourishment, and I was happy to be delayed a little bit coming from Bellar Beach this morning, seeing 75 dump trucks full of sand lined up on Gulf Boulevard to create new berms and new uh, uh, sand dunes out there. So, you know, I know you're, he's looking at everything, and Beach Nervous was up there, and I'm confident that we'll have the funds to take care of that as we need to. So, thank you. Thank you, and and I do apologize for the timing on that. We 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 had it originally. The announcement was going to be two weeks earlier, so we were going to have the TDC meeting. Everything was going to fall in place, and everything got delayed. And I'm like, what you mean I got to go to a TDC a joint TDC meeting, and we can't say anything because otherwise it would have been out the next day in headlines and it would completely undercut the announcement. And so I do apologize for the timing. That's kind of this, the way it worked out. But, you know, there's never, there's never been um, a, a lack of commitment to the beaches. We understand the impact that it has on the county, and um, we do have to figure it out. I mean, I give, you know, the credit um, for the beach nourishment goes to the commission. You know, they, you know, our public works department got um, a initial estimate for down at Sunset Beach of $6 million. Um, we had a budget meeting that night. We told the commissioners about it. That was our, that was the first estimate. They authorized $21 million on a budget amendment that night for us to go, and that's what made it happen. And so our public works team did, you know, within a week have sand on the beach, and uh, and they're continuing to go. Um, but you know, when we gave you that estimate, you know, we, we weren't talking about emergency repairs. So our if you remember, we were talking about nourishment and stuff. So we really have to figure out a solution. I know Brian's going to talk about that later in the meeting. We've got to figure out a solution with the core because it really needs to be a shared cost. Um, that would that would stretch our budget. It could be done, but it would stretch our budget over time, depending upon the times that we have to go build berms, <laughs> which, you know, who knows? Um, we haven't had to before, but we just did. So, you know, we're, we, we, the, we've got tourists. And we've got the money. Um, we just got to manage it judiciously, and hopefully, we'll find a solution here with the core. Mayor Bolchowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to say, Dave, um, in our deal with the with the Jays, we did exactly what Barry's doing. We just simplified it. We took all of those ticket fees and percentages and stuff. Um, and we got out of the business of taking care of the stadium. I mean, we had our parks guys in there emptying garbage. For what? I mean, they've got more people than God to be able to do this stuff. Um, so in the long run, we didn't take a piece of naming rights or nothing. But what we did, and I think is what Barry's doing, is we took some of the value of that stuff and asked them to put it towards future improvements to the stadium when needed, you know. If you got an air conditioner breaks or a roof's got to be replaced or whatever, um, you know, that way it would be set up for success. So it is pretty common for, for these more simplified agreements. And it, let me tell you, it's been the best thing for our community and our city to have those simplified things that we don't have to put that strain on our staff. But I also just wanted to say something to you, Barry, um, something to think about. Um, I'm sure many of you have had kids that have gone through the school system here or maybe still have kids in the system. Um, this county is a big baseball county. It really is. Football is not the thing. It's baseball um, and some soccer. But I will say that one of the things we did was had our high school have the ability to play in our stadium, their home games. And, you know, I certainly hope we can get the Phillies to do the same for Clearwaters and Countryside. Um, but there is a state tournament 
Dunedin happens to go almost every year. But I mean, it, it would be a cool thing for them to host it, um, something like that for our kids to be able to play baseball in a major league stadium, not just the spring training stadium, you know, for the, for the state tournament. It's usually held in Fort Myers, um, but it'd be great to have all those people travel here. So I, I just throw that out there for you to think about. I'll comment real quick because I am a Pinellas County baseball kid. Um, and so that is certainly something, uh, both administration and, and mine, frankly, that we want to make sure happens, that our kids are able to play on that field. Uh, my senior all-star game was played on that field. It changed the way I thought about baseball. Um, during high school, I played in Winter Haven at the Indians complex. I've played on Dunedin's field, the Phillies field. It's an important part about being a young baseball player. And so we're going to continue to make sure that th that opportunity happens um, for, for all, frankly, all of Tampa Bay. Yeah. Thank you. Other question? Anybody else? Okay, Barry, I think you've made your point. All right. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. And next, I'm very proud to say, we have a couple of representatives here from Allegiant Airlines, and I'll let Tom Jewsbury do the proper introductions. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Tom Jewsbury, Executive Director of the St. Pete Clearwater Airport. Um, I'm proud to introduce uh, Scott D'Angelo, who is the uh, Executive VP uh, and Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, him and Fane Klinger, who's here with us, who we uh, work with on a regular basis, uh, flew in last night to be here to do a presentation. Uh, we all realize how important Allegiant is to our, our community and the economic impact they have. So we're going to get into a little more detail uh, and overview. So, Scott. Thank you. Welcome. And that jet is just beautiful, by oh. the way. <laughs> we think so, too, and we saw them all lined up. Uh, pretty birds. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, Madam Chair, Council. Um, outside of my day job, I actually sit on the board of directors for the Las Vegas Convention and Vis Visitors Authority, where I, I chair the, the marketing committee. So I feel right at home talking about stadiums, one of which we have our name on, and of course, ballparks going in there as well. So best of luck with your efforts um, on that. Uh, I can assure you the economic impact absolutely does uh, come, as we've seen. And, and yes, we had two Taylor Swift concerts, a couple Beyonce in there as well. Um, I know you received this ahead of time, and many of you are familiar, so I won't go page by page, but really wanted to point out um, why St. Pete, Pete Clearwater is so important to us uh, and a variety of things going on at Allegiant that have positive implications for our continued growth together. Uh, for those of you who do know us, you know we have a very unique business model. We focus on leisure travel. It often means we're not flying every day of the week. We're flying when the majority of leisure travelers are flying, and that allows us to keep fares low and reach a lot of people in a lot of places that other airlines either can't or, or won't go. Um, most of our flights have limited to no direct nonstop competition. We go into small and mid-sized markets that are unserved or underserved. And by virtue of that, many of the folks we're bringing anywhere we go, but specifically here to St. Pete Clearwater area, uh, would have no other direct way uh, to get here. So in most of those cases, they're incremental to folks that might come through TPA or through other airlines. Uh, and last but not least, where we value your partnership the most, yours, the airports, VCPC, is that we directly sell to consumers. We don't sell through Expedia's or Booking.com. So the billions of advertising that they do, right, that doesn't help us. And so any and all help that we get with our partners to continue to get the Allegiant brand, and specifically our some 60 routes uh, here in Depay are, are, are very important for us. Um, you can see our, our network here, as I, I mentioned, we serve some 90 plus small and mid-sized cities throughout this nation that otherwise don't have direct nonstop flights, uh, and we fly them to some 30 odd world-class uh, destinations, um, this being one of the biggest ones. Uh, you can see here just as we've grown our, our number of routes, those orange bars are 
showing the, the number of routes that, that have no competition on them, or put another way, um, we're the only ones flying you know, directly nonstop from those markets. Real quick on this page, just to give you kind of a behind the scenes look uh, at just what good financial shape Allegiant remains in. Uh, this year, we'll spend a little over $900 million on, on capital. A little over half of that is on aircraft itself. But there's a number down there, it's 142 million uh, other airline capital expenditures. A big part of that has been major systems implementation, specifically our res management and our operating frontline systems. We all know what happened with Southwest last December, and you know we're gonna be darned if we're gonna let that happen to us. So we have spent a lot to modernize our core systems, whether it's res management, whether it's back office finance and accounting, whether it's our maintenance systems, to really just have everything latest and greatest so we never get to that point uh, where a rubber band or a piece of duct tape breaks on the technology and all of a sudden, you know, your, your customers and, and the nation at large, in the case of last December, is, is, is left at that. Um, but that 500 million on aircraft is important too, and that's, that's what you'll see on the bottom chart there. We'll finish this year with about 127 aircraft in our fleet. Uh, we'll start welcoming 737 MAXs uh, at the end of this year, and you can see that in the yellow bars there. And we plan to grow to 140 aircraft next year, uh, 154 the year after that. It'll be a combination of these new planes coming on, but they all won't be net new. We also have older aircraft that it will enable us to retire. And the key, key thing there is, yes, greater capacity, so more routes, uh, but also greater reliability. You know, these planes aren't unlike cars. You drive that first car off the lot, call me in a year for the first oil change anymore. Um, older aircraft, they require more maintenance, uh, less reliability. So as we modernize our fleet, uh, the overall product will get better. We'll talk about that in a second but reliability is the big winner there. Uh, we have 50 of these aircraft uh, coming in in the next two years with options for, for 80 more, which we uh, fully intend at this point uh, to be taking. So uh, when it comes to aircraft, as long as they can keep coming off that Boeing line, uh, we will be in no shortage of those in the foreseeable future. Um, these aircraft are way more efficient from an environmental perspective, uh, from a fuel burn perspective, so they stand to just make our economics even stronger, which the stronger we are, the greater we're able to grow uh, in places like here. State of our business. Um, so we'll look here just at the, the right chart. I'm in marketing, so I look at web users too, but the right chart here is showing bookings, and the orange line is prior year, which was the greatest for the airline industry in the history of the world. And the blue line shows, shows this year. And the first thing and the only thing really on this chart I would show you is we move into that June time period to the, the right side of the right chart. What you see is that blue line and that orange line converge. They're almost the same, meaning we are in those time periods booking as many people as we were booking last year in a record setting year. Um, but this chart, and I apologize for going kind of economist on you here, is where the picture gets better and what a lot of people don't see. Um, if we first focus on those orange lines, that orange solid line was what we booked last year, and that orange dotted line, which is quite a ways below it, was what we actually ended up flying last year. And the difference represents all the cancellations that were made because we put up flights that we didn't have the capacity or the crew to fulfill, and we saw this through the industry. And the blue lines show this year, right? That solid light blue is what we booked, and that dotted darker blue is what's actually been flown. And what you can see is those lines are much closer. Our operation, along with the whole industry, learned a lot last year about how disruptive it was to go in with your eyes being bigger than your stomach, so to speak, right? You would put up all these flights. You wouldn't either have the planes or the pilots to be able to fly them and it was a bad customer experience and you know, tons of disruption and cost. So when you look at this year, A, the operations have improved dramatically, but from a commercial point of view, 
especially as you get to the right of the chart, that dark blue dotted line is above the orange dotted line, meaning that this year we're seeing even better performance than the record setting last year. And while I can't share it to the right, I can tell you, as you'll hear in our upcoming earnings in a week or two, right, that trend has continued. And in fact, uh, 2023 for us uh, will set records in terms of revenue generation and profitability that, that wasn't there last year when there was that disruption. Um, key thing you're hearing about, and we ask our customers every week about this, we did it during COVID, now we do it about the economy, is how are you feeling about the economy? And I know the bars are, are small, but that, that top blue and that yellow line that I've kind of put in the red dotted box there, are people saying, we think the economy is getting much worse or somewhat worse? So take those kind of two combined as the percent of people thinking the economy is getting worse. Back in early July, it was about 50% between those two bars saying that. Uh, as of last weekend, which isn't even quite shown here, it took a couple ticks down. It's about 70% saying that. But here's the good news when it comes to leisure travel. Those same respondents are asked, well, when do you plan to purchase your next trip? And if you look at that same time period in the box, those lines aren't slanting down. The, the blue represents I'm going to take it and buy it in the next 30 days. The orange is sometime in the next one to three months. And the reality is 60% keep saying, you know, we plan to, we plan to travel. So despite the fact that they have continued worries about the economy, it's not creeping into leisure travel, at least among our customer base. We have a variety of strategic initiatives, but none probably stand to, to impact Pi uh, more than our prospective joint venture with Viva Airbus, which will have these two airlines combining um, for travel from the domestic US uh, down to major Mexico beach destinations, uh, most notably Cancun, uh, Cabo, and, and Puerto Vallarta. Uh, this stands, you can see the thin lines heading over to the, the, the west and southwest coast of, uh, of Florida stand to not only give residents here the ability to visit world-class Mexico beaches uh, via this agreement, uh, but also usher in uh, an entire new customer set from various parts of, of Mexico uh, here to St. Pete Clearwater area. Um, real quick status on this, you know, we had hoped to be launching it um, end of this year. Uh, Mexico just got back its Category 1 status, as many are familiar with, which enables um, carriers to add new routes. Uh, right now, the, the U.S. government and the Mexico government um, are at odds over uh, reductions that are happen happening at MEX, Mexico City's major airport. And uh, our application, our, our, our ATI, um, you know, antitrust uh, immunity is on hold until they get that sorted out, despite the fact that they're unrelated. Uh, but we hope that'll happen in the next couple of months. And within 90 days of that, uh, we can begin announcing uh, what routes will be available. They'll go on sale. And some 90 days after that, they'll be, uh, they'll be flying. Why St. Pete Clearwater is so important to us? When we look at round trips by destination, uh, Pi is second only to Las Vegas uh, and SFB, uh, you know, greater Orlando area, and it's not by much. This is a, a, a world-class important destination for a legion, and I would argue it's not only one of the top ones, it's the one with, with the greatest upside. And, and here's why. This next, page shows round trip items by origin. And while clearly this council is all about attracting uh, more heads and beds, uh, more visitors, more dollars being spent uh, in the area, the reason it's so important to see that St. Pink Clearwater is only like slightly, it's like several thousand, it's virtually tied with SFB for our biggest origin city is because as an airline, it is much easier to make the case uh, and ultimately grow in markets where you're flying full planes both ways. And the fact that 
we're flying 1.2 million passengers in here a year and flying 1.2 million outbound a year makes this the perfect market to continue to expand in because it's not like, say, Las Vegas, where on any given Friday, you may have a full plane coming from Stockton, California to Las Vegas, but it's not full with Las Vegans wanting to go spend a weekend in Stockton, right? Not dissing Stockton, just saying we need that balance, and that balance is what enables us to continue to invest along with the airport uh, and along with you in growing the routes in here because we know that not only do people love to come here, that this is a big metro area and they're using us to also travel uh, and we can be profitable growing both ways in this market. Real quick in closing, kind of in and around, you know, what does Allegiant stand for? This was a survey that was conducted around, uh, amongst U.S. general population, so not just Allegiant customers. Leisure travelers were asked, what are the most important factors that comes when choosing your flight? Uh, and no surprise, low cost and having a nonstop flight option were number one and number two. Yet the same customers were asked, you know, among your preferred airline, how well do they deliver on these things that are important to you? And all of a sudden you can see those orange boxes kind of slip to the middle. Put another way, these airlines were not delivering well on the things that were most important to customers. Uh, and if you haven't ever seen it in any materials we've sent or heard it from me, um, hear this now. When our customers are asked, what airline did you last fly or do you most frequently fly? The answers are never the other ULCCs. About a third say Southwest, a little over a quarter say Delta, American has 20%, United 15%, and then every other airline competes for that last 10 to 15% or so. The customers that we're flying in here are largely customers with Southwest or Delta who, when it comes from getting to Cincinnati down to here, do not want to make that stop in Atlanta and choose us for that nonstop version and others um, where they are more of a budget traveler um, we'll do it for, for both. Um, but the key insight into all of our customers, here you're seeing that same chart, but on the left are our avid travelers who are more affluent, who, yeah, low price is important for them too, but you can see the one that box is boxed there, that sky high importance is nonstop flights. This is your Delta, your Southwest, your network carrier that's saying, hey, it's one thing for business, I don't care how fast I get there and I'll stay in a club in Atlanta, you know, in the meantime while I wait. Uh, but when they're traveling with their families, when they're traveling with loved ones or friends uh, for leisure, they want to get there as fast as possible and want to avoid that layover. On the right are the portion of our customers that are more budget travelers and you can see, yes, nonstop's important for them too, but the boxed one is lowest fare. And these are folks, but not for that ultra low cost, um, they're not able to make the vacation. What they can all agree on is this, the money they save on airfare, when asked, what are you gonna spend it on? Number one, dining, greater hotel accommodation, followed by entertainment, shopping, all things that, that drive greater revenues uh, in and around a, a world-class destination like this. Um, we talked about stadiums, we have a big one we're super proud of there, but. We'll, we'll end with uh, a, a couple of quick comments around, you know, just as we've done so successfully and just wrapped up with VSPC uh, with the airport, we pride ourselves on being an ecosystem player and we, we, we partner, whether it's with resort partners, uh, CVBs, DMOs, airports, uh, to do just fun and interesting things that just really help our brand and the destination come alive. Um, I did a Wall Street Journal interview about a month ago. Uh, one of the writers saw that we were selling Johnny Walker Blue uh, for $35 on there along with some Don Julio, some higher end uh, <clears throat> Prosecco, half bottles of wine. Uh, I use this to show and just reinforce that point I made about the Allegiant customer base. That there's a segment, whether they're traveling to and from Florida to their second homes uh, and or whether they're those very frequent flyers that want this nonstop flight down here to Florida uh, that are supporting what is the best buy on board menu in the entire industry. You can see here uh, through customer data-driven insights, whether it's 
us knowing that they do want some of those high-end spirits, uh, that they don't like ready-to-mix drinks, and so we have mixers with, with great quality spirits, um, along with a great food selection, uh, and it's tremendously successful because, again, a lot of these customers want that vacation to start as soon as that beautiful, bright sun plane comes around and up to the gate. Um, both on our existing fleet and specifically on our new Boeings that will be coming in, uh, we will have completely revamped interiors. The seats are more comfortable cushion-wise. The tray tables are, are full ones, not those little ones. And up to 30% of the plane will be uh, fitted with Allegiant Extra Legroom product. Uh, this is something that sits on about 15 of our planes today. We continue to retrofit as planes go in for their heavy checks and make our entire uh, fleet this way. But the product is getting much, much better for the, the visitors uh, that bring us here. And last but not least, uh, many of the folks that come here uh, do so repeatedly uh, through the year. And we're going to be offering them a subscription service where for X dollars a month, right, four, six, eight round trips a year makes it easy for them to just go ahead, go online, and having already paid for it, just hear the dates I want to fly and get me down to pie. So in any event, that's where we currently are. Um, oh, sorry, one last thing. Um, a, a big part of, 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 of every um, airline is uh, the co-branded credit card. Ours is no different. Our uh, Allegiant always rewards a Visa. Five years running as best airline credit card as voted uh, by the USA Today uh, Reader's Choice Awards. Uh, you will start to see in, in, in this market where we have many cardholders uh, a high profile um, ad campaign, um, just want to plug it, uh, October 26th, Thursday Night Football, that's Bill's box. Uh, you may see an iconic uh, American Idol who you don't see a lot do endorsements, but comes from a small town, and we're going to be very proud to have her uh, as a marketing partner as we go through this, and you'll also capture a, a lot of our spots uh, during Bucks games as we, we do a lot of NFL advertising for this program, so keep an eye out for that. And with that, I will close it and open it for any questions. Thank you. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Scott, great presentation. Uh, it's always nice to see uh, enthusiastic marketers that talk about our destination and proud of their product. Um, I applaud you with your, your aircraft, uh, the number of uh, growth. Um, with that, are you targeting specific destinations that you're not including on routes today that those new planes can serve and they and might they be feeder cities to pi yeah absolutely so the the main governing thing is we bring these new planes on we will um start to move around we're an all airbus fleet today so bases will either be in the future all boeing or all airbus so we can reduce the complexity um, but yes, some of those will have the overwater capability, which some of our planes don't have today. So that enables for you know, us to fly some of those Mexico routes as well. Uh, and then the other thing is there's two ways that we grow. And the, the, the one that you reference, uh, there's additional dots that we can be connecting uh, to Pi. In fact, I joked last night uh, with the airport folks, I don't know what dot I wouldn't want to connect to Pi, just given the, the assortment that we have today. But the other thing it'll enable us to do, especially some of these 737-800 series, which is up, up gauge as we put it, seats more people, is we can begin to fly more on the existing routes where there's demand for us to maybe fly twice a week where it's once or twice a day where it's once a day. So we're gonna look in both those directions to be able to continue to grow. And like I said, this market is so balanced that it's a no-brainer to grow because you're not worried about, well, I can bring more people in, but what about outbound? The fact that 1.2 million going each way makes this just such a leading market for just high field growth. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Commissioner Moore. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your input. Um, I'm going to go off script here a little bit. I haven't touched base with Brian on this, but um, Creative Pinellas is our arts council for Pinellas County. And um, I've noticed that there has been mention, and I'm a frequent flyer of Allegiant, so I do read the, the uh, in-flight uh, news, and th there has been mention of arts and culture here. 
uh, but we'd like to see that expanded. So I'm just welcoming the opportunity to say that it would be great if Allegiant could partner with Pinellas County through Creative Pinellas on possible sponsorships for future endeavors. So just wanted to get that out there um, after our board meeting last week. Uh, just we were brainstorming and this seemed like a good fit, so. Absolutely, and just so you know, that magazine gets almost as much readership as Southern Living. I, as you know, magazines, traditional ones have gone out. We fly about 17 million, two thirds tell us they read it. So one, happy to do that. And Jeff will send my contact information and make it available. So please do reach out because we are very committed in supporting the arts, um, the food scenes, you name it, the things that make destinations like this so special. So we're, we're all in. That's great. And looking forward to the Fly Club. Yes. So thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Kimball. Um, great presentation. Uh, you also are in the rooms book and business. Can you tell us there's any changes in that area you're doing with there's these new big ones? Control? Yeah, so one of our biggest initiative, um, I skirted it over, but you'll see in the big, we call it Allegiant 2.0. We are doing a lot of tech transformation to be able to gain access to way more hotel inventory. In the past, Las Vegas was the only place that you would go to at Allegiant.com and, and have a comparable set of hotel and resort offerings than say Expedia. Uh, as we do this, We've added tons new inventory, and so you know our hope is for the St. Pete Clearwater area that just like if you went to Las Vegas, you see the vast majority represented, and that as we call it UI UX, the digital interface works very much like an OTA where it's much easier to package. So I'm glad you brought that point up because I skirted over it, but that's a, a, a big deal for us just by way of numbers. Last year, we only had about 300 hotels and about like 100 of them were in Las Vegas. Uh, we're already up to 800 and we'll be up to several thousand just nationwide, but, but an area like Pi stands to really gain because the assortment that we had wasn't really reflective of all the staying options here and, and, and will be in the near future. Uh, second question, and that is uh, marketing for the county into your company into the uh, re reservationists and, and all out in Vegas that you have. Um, I think our group, I think my person's going next week or the week after, I think they're going out. The partner and, conference, and, and yeah, the partner party as we call it. And different, count, uh, different county areas, chambers and so forth go out on their own as a group and everything. Do you have any, um, I would suggest that maybe you look at that and say is there, what's the best way for the biggest impact for our Visit St. Pete yeah. Clearwater into that market as you're growing the rooms business yep. and everything and the, the new sites, whether you could help help us get a bigger impact for the dollars we spend or what we should be spending. Yeah, absolutely. And and the knee jerk and Jeff will talk about this, you know, let's get with customer care, right? Because there are a lot of times on the call, someone's called, said, Hey, I need to make my flight change to to Pi, no problem. Hey, by the way, I noticed you haven't booked a hotel. Do you need a place to stay? So Education there in the, in the call center and customer care can go a long way. And then we'll talk a lot about what we do uh, with our, our, our drip email campaigns, meaning you've booked something, and between the time you book and the time you fly, I'm talking to you up to six times, and those emails, everybody opens them, right? Because you're like, did something change with my flight? So really using those to push, whether it's places to stay, whether it's the art scenes, that's a great communication vehicle for getting in front of people that we know we're coming here, but you know, having to either book their hotel with us and or um, don't have an itinerary plan. So we'll continue to keep that dialogue open, but I'll work with Jeff and the team coming out so they can start next Friday doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor uh, Prather. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we as a TDC um, target certain markets. Um, some major targets, some minor targets. Are there, are there destinations that Allegiant serves that you think we should be targeting our marketing dollars to that uh, we're not? Destinations or origin to get them here, do you mean? Origins to get them here. Yeah. Um, no, I think we've done a good job. We work with BCPC. Um, you know, there was West Virginia, Arkansas, and Utah in the, in the latest version. Um, so that probably represents some of the newer markets. Um, so there's no other ones, but we, we keep looking very closely at, you know, even longstanding markets. If 
if there's help needed uh, through digital marketing, we've gotten really sophisticated being able to allocate those dollars in front of the eyeballs that people that are looking to come to this area, in many cases, uh, maybe planning to, to come to Tampa and we're able to get in front of them and, and, and bring them to Pi and, and down to this area. So yeah, there's no blatant holes missing and we work really closely with BSPC to, to find and identify those that can need help and turn up the volume a little. Thank you. You've been such a great partner to our county, so we appreciate it. Thank you. We appreciate you. Anyone else have questions, concerns, anything? Okay, well, I have, I have a question. Yes. I have not heard you say anything in your presentation about your relationship with, for example, our fabulous baseball team, i.e. the Rays. And when I listened to you and I didn't hear anything about them, I remembered or I thought back about being in the stadium because I'm there a lot. There's nothing in there that says anything about Allegiant. So in terms of marketing and partnerships and stuff like that, it seems to me that that's a great new opportunity for you. Uh, absolutely. So one of the myths, and we're debunking it with the data I showed you, was that, and this is true of Las Vegas, it's true of Orlando, it was true of this area, was it was like people only fly here, but the people that live here don't fly out, right? Like. People only go to Vegas, like us Las Vegans, never fly out. And so therefore, like many of the sponsorship dollars, like you would see in Cincinnati or Indianapolis, et cetera, were spent there. Now with the data that I'm showing, it says, hold on a second. Actually, there's more origin you know, customers out of here than there is even Cincinnati, where we sponsor their FC Cincinnati Soccer Club, or Indianapolis, where we sponsor the Colts. Um, is changing that dialogue. So just like I mentioned and, and teased that we're going to be, you're going to be seeing advertising here. Next up, I think if, if that works, then especially with the existing and or the, the, the new ballpark, because I realize it's still four years off, represents new opportunities for us to view this area very differently than we have traditionally. And that's, that's kind of what drives those investments in, in, in sponsorship. So um, yeah, stay tuned, but it's, it's definitely something that we'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye toward. Very good. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Here. Appreciate the time. Thank you. One thing I'll mention is uh, you may find interesting, um, actually, you were talking about the uh, different beverages that are served. The official beer for Allegiant is still Three Daughters Brewery. Yeah. Have a, which, of course, we have the, uh, only the second location in the county located in the airport. So. Yeah, they're always looking for opportunities to market with, uh, with the local community. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank we you. do have some uh, PIE uh, advertising swag that we're, uh, Jeff's going to hand out and leave for you. So thank you for this opportunity. All right. Next on our agenda is global travel with uh, Brazil sales mission recap. Andrea. Please come forward. Good morning, everyone. It's a wonderful pleasure to be here this morning and share with you about the Brazil sale mission that VSPC hosted during the week of August 21st to 25th. And it's important to remember, too, that this is the first Brazil VSPC sales mission that we hosted since the pandemic. The delegation for the mission was Commissioner Long, Brian Loak, and me. And the territory that we covered during the mission, the decision maker for the territory, it was due to the amount of two operators and OTA, the online travel agents, based in those cities, Sao Paulo and Curitiba. Rio de Janeiro was a selection as well, due to the amount of travel devices that focus on the premium and uh, in the luxury market. The mission objectives was to, first of all, to introduce the delegation to the Brazilian hospitality industry and to maintain and create relationships with the trade industry. Relationship that they can continue to develop destination packages with two operators and bring new opportunities to the visas in Peak Clearwater to maintain our presence and brand relevance. Our first meeting uh, in Brazil, we actually met with the general manager for Navia Wraps representation company, Dennis Ribeiro, who provided us with an overview of the Brazilian hospitality industry, an um, overview of the market. 
Dennis also made it very important to, um, to share with us the importance of having a full-time representation in Brazil to continue the work that the team, the Latin America department team does in the sales and marketing initiatives. And it's important to know that during the pandemic and post-pandemic, the virtual destination education training sessions was very important. And nowadays, they're looking for in-person, in-person education sessions, in-person trade shows, and also in-person to connect and learn about the destination. Commissioner Long met with the CEO of the Panhotas Trade Media during the IPW trade show. Panhotas is the largest trade media in Brazil, and as soon as they knew we were coming with a delegate or with our mission to Brazil, they he connected with me. He would like to welcome the delegation with a client event networking um, opportunity for us to interact and reconnect with the two operators and OTAs owners and also the U.S. product managers, the ones that runs and makes a decision or creating package and continue to develop the destination. During this client event, we had the opportunity to network with the crucial clients, but Panhot has also planned three small um, presentations to present to the delegation. First of all, Panhot has provided an overview of the hospitality industry. The second is the presentation, they welcome the U.S. Commercial Council to provide a U.S. visa update. Very important to know that is that since right now, we are looking into for the Brazilians to request the renew of the U.S. visa a month wait. And for the first time visa request, it's about a year wait. Huge improvement since the pandemic. There was almost three and a half years wait. The third and final presentation that Panhot has put it together during our delegation visit, it's, it was actually the Magda Massa. She's the president of Above Association. ABAVE stands for Association of Brazilian Travel Devices. They put it together once a year, a trade show, usually in the month of September. And they, they mentioned the importance of having our brand and our presence during the show. We also conducted about 15 one-on-one, -on -one, two operators meetings in Brazil, and we were able to connect with US product managers, the decision makers. Some of them were new to us. Some of them, we had a long lasting relationship. That's the case of Luisa Oliveira Lopoldo. She used to work with us uh, when she, she was at the Azul Airlines to operate it. Now she has a new house, Smiles Viagens to operate it, and we reconnected with us to make sure that we can present a destination and start promoting in packages. We also met with Bruno Delfin. He belongs to the U.S. product manager for the BWT operator, based in the city of Curitiba. Um, we have a great relationship with Bruno. He has continued to promote the destination for many years. But during the mission, he introduced us to a very unique product. They own, uh, in Curitiba, a vintage train with different wagons. And they, he had this idea that for fiscal year 24, we could collaborate. Bruno can welcome in one of the wagons, the train wagons, about maybe 30, 35 uh, crucial travel devices that buys his products. And I can train them in a full day on the train about the destination. Again, it's very vital for us is that one-on-one -on -one in-person education and training sessions. We also met, like I mentioned before, some new two operators and new contacts. That's Pedro Falcon. He actually is the US product manager for Personal Brazil two operator based in Curitiba. We have never worked with Personal Brazil. And the reason why is because before the pandemic, the two operator only focused in Europe. And since the pandemic, they start actually selling and promoting in the United States. And now we have a connection with the sales and the marketing team and we'll continue to promote the destination to create our packages. During the mission, we did receive um, press release and stories. Uh, Brian Loak provided two media interviews. And uh, in our meeting with Rosa Masgrau, the CEO for Mercados and Eventos, uh, the second largest trade media in Brazil, we received a bonus ad to have our presence during the above trade show that happened in the city of Rio de Janeiro and that's the Association for the Travel Advisors. Very important to our destination is as for us to continue to promote the destination in in-person presentations. 
So we did end the mission in Rio de Janeiro, presenting the destination for about 48 travel advisors. Like I mentioned before, focus on the premium luxury market. We also have the presence of two two operators that after one hour and a half for in-person educating training session, I was to be able to connect with the two operators and start a relationship to develop some package of our destination. It's also very important to realize that when the wholesalers um, put it out some, uh, some rates in our destination, the two operators incorporate those rates into the packages, and the travel devices can sell those packages to the final consumer. If the travel devices are not fully trained and educated in our destination, they have the power to change the final consumer decision and come into our area. So that's very important to the Latin America department to continue to train in-person education training to make sure they understand that we have what we have to offer in our destination. I also wanted to take the opportunity to mention that those destination presentations we provide in Brazil and our crucial market in Latin America, it's something that I was very excited to share during the mission that the Latin American department is always looking for those opportunities to when we are traveling and are promoting the destination. We are always looking for opportunities to provide destination training presentations before and after a trade show, a road show, a sales missions. Uh, we also provide some scheduled presentations coming up from our two operator media um, clients, and we'll continue to uh, provide the destination presentations. In fact, I wanted to share with you the fiscal year 23, the Latin America Department conducted 1,796 uh, destination presentations in our crucial markets, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, and Mexico, and we look forward in fiscal year 24 with a, lot, a much higher and uh, lasting relationship. I wanted to thank you, Commissioner Long, for joining the VSPC Brazil sales mission and, um, and actually meeting with our crucial clients. And at this time, does anyone have any questions for me? Anyone? Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just like to add to that, um, uh, say to Andrea Brigado, um, this was my first opportunity to go down. And I know when folks think of Visit St. Pete Clearwater, they think that we just buy ads uh, and, and market the destination through our advertising. Um, but we've got multiple departments that are out throughout the world doing what Andrea and her team do uh, on a daily basis. And it was my first opportunity to get out there, uh, be boots on the ground, and really sell the destination. So. Uh, again, Brigada, Andrea, and I look forward to more. Thank you, Brian. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Taylor Trowbridge to do the Ad Effectiveness Survey pro program. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining me this morning and joining us this morning. Um, also, uh, Thank you, Scott, for uh, whetting the appetite on survey and data uh, as I'm going to get into a little deeper here. Um, as we're going to discuss today, um, we are looking at the ad effectiveness for the um, last uh, campaign for Visit St. Pete Clearwater in fall and winter of 22 and rolling into 23. This was the ad campaign that took place between September of 22 and March of 23. We conducted the survey shortly thereafter in July. <laughs> of 23, so uh, most recently, and we went out to 14 markets, as you guys know, of our uh, feeder markets here into the destination and conducted 4,400 surveys um, among those 14 markets. So today we're just gonna look over the ROI and the uh, economic impact of the uh, advertising campaign, as well as some key metrics from this campaign as well. Um, it's important to note here that we use a very conservative model when we're doing our ROI on advertising. Um, certain models will just take into those that visited uh, the destination during uh, the campaign run. Some will do a more conservative, those that saw the ad campaign. Um, but we even go a little more conservative when we look at our ROI and our economic impact. We want to make sure not only are we looking at those that saw the ad campaign, but those that have noted within their survey responses that they are influenced or were influenced by the ad to come visit the destination. So from there, we have a, you know, a base of those that are interested and those that saw the ad, and then we can you know, understand how much they plan to spend or how much they spent in market, what they spent it on, 
and then from there devise our uh, economic impact and uh, direct spend to the destination. So I like to say sometimes I get to be in the good news business. Today I'm in the good news business. <laughs> I get to report to you guys that you know, direct uh, spend from visitors uh, that saw this ad campaign was $165 million. Also from that uh, ad campaign or from this most recent ad campaign, we saw $270 million in economic impact. So that is not just direct spending, but indirect spending as well as induced spending. So look at it as your total ec economic uh, impact from uh, the visitors coming to the destination. More importantly, for every dollar that was spent on advertising for this la latest campaign, we saw a $42 uh, spend or $42 economic impact, almost $42 economic impact for the destination. So um, as you'll see on the next slide, not only is this, you know, a fantastic number to see. So for every dollar we're putting into advertising, we're seeing over $41, almost $42 back. But there's a continuing trend over the last several uh, iterations of um, advertising that this is continuing to increase. So as we're putting in um, a similar dollar amount in advertising, we're seeing uh, a significant increase in the ROI, as well as significant increase in the direct visitor spend, um, as it has uh, been the last couple iterations of the uh, fall winter campaigns, we're seeing about a 15% uh, increase in the, uh, the ROI um, from the previous campaigns. So not only do we look at uh, ROI when we look at um, the advertising effectiveness, we also want to understand, well, what do uh, travelers and, and what do um, those in the markets that we go out to feel about? And, and what do they you know, know about the campaign? So we ask simple questions like, do you recall the campaign? Um, and what are your feelings about the campaign? So certainly um, what we saw here was that travelers really were drawn to this campaign. After asking them, have you seen anything related to this campaign, whether it was digital, video, specific elements, about 25% were aware of it, um, a really robust number there. And more importantly, those that saw the ad or those that recalled the ad, and then once we exposed them to the ads, it was really effective in conveying the messages that are key to the destination. So, you know, those uplifting vibes, world-class beaches, all of those key selling points that we are including in the advertising are coming across and being retained by consumers. So again, not just, you know, looking at the, uh, the dollar amount, but also elements within the campaign are being recalled, are being uh, seen positively as well. Some additional uh, information here about some of these metrics is really how do they impact travel, right? So after seeing the advertising or being exposed to the advertising, 50% are more likely to visit St. Pete Clearwater. So that's a great number to see after viewing an ad. Um, think about actions that you would take after viewing any number of ads. How many of you can say that half of you would, you know, go to the destination or take an action because of that ad? Um, and then certainly, more importantly, is we, you know, we surveyed those uh, travelers or potential travelers before seeing the ad and then after seeing the ad, and you can see the lift there um, and the impact of the ad that it has on, you know, St. Pete uh, Clearwater being an ideal fit for uh, a leisure travel destination. So those ads are not only working in conveying the message about world-class beaches and, and, you know, unique um, arts and culture, but also in, you know, getting the message across that it's an ideal fit for their lifestyle, whether they're a family traveler, a single traveler, traveling um, for, for any number of reasons, uh, St. Pete Clearwater is an ideal fit for them. So that's all I have today. Are there any questions that you guys have for me? Questions, Commissioner Henderson? A little confused, I'm sorry. Of course. Um, you talk about the re uh, ROI, economic impact for the campaign. Is that the ROI economic impact of the 25% that were exposed? This is total. So uh, not just those that were exposed. They had to have not only been exposed, but then they would have said that they are planning to travel because of the ad. So it's an even smaller number than that 25%. Okay, and that, and that is what the 165 economic? That is correct. Is, that's smaller than 25%. That is correct. Great, okay. So yes, we just like to take a conservative approach to that economic uh, number as to not overstate it or to not, you know, provide you a number that, you know, looks good on paper but isn't realistic in, in what you're digesting. Perfect. Thank you. Anyone else? Anybody go? 
All right, thank you. Thank you. And next we have um, Taylor Trowbridge. Oh no, that's Taylor. Katie Bridge, uh, Eddie Kirsch, and Katie Bridges. If you would come up, please. Good morning. Good morning. What an exciting day so far. So hopefully we'll just continue the, the momentum here and we'll be talking about, um, you know, we've kind of already shared some of our strategies and plans for this next fiscal year. This is really getting into the exact tactics and there's, there's a lot of them. So we'll be going through a lot of slides kind of quickly um, and if you guys have questions, please let us know. Um, but sort of just recapping the strategy which we, we've shared previously with you guys and hopefully this not, nothing's too surprising here. Our objectives are to drive visitation to the St. Pete Clearwater area to build awareness and intent to travel to the destination to engage uh, with our audience. So we're actually creating conversions uh, to increase the amount of money that they're spending when they are in destination and really to let the world know that St. Pete Clearwater is a premier destination with a diverse collection of beaches, of arts and culture, of baseball included. Um, and we also, of course, want to highlight the inclusive and diverse culture of our destination as well and, and represent that in our marketing. So to uh, <coughs> attack those objectives, our strategies uh, really haven't changed too much. We prioritize the markets that offer the greatest uh, opportunity for us to draw visitation. We use a media mix. You know, marketing is, is touching people a, a, a lot of different places at, over and over and over. Um, identifying the opportunities to really elevate our brand, uh, not just through advertising, but through brand partnerships, through activations in our markets, through uh, unique media opportunities, which, uh, you know, we, we welcome Jason to our team. I'm sure we'll welcome him officially later. Uh, and, and also uh, to market St. Pete Clearwater, not just as a snowbird place, but as a four season destination and really put an emphasis on driving visitation during our need periods. And of course, we're constantly trying to uh, identify new strategies and really elevate our brand message, um, not just you know one time, but throughout the year. Um, ho hopefully this looks a little bit familiar to you guys, but really um, in terms of an integrated marketing approach, we're looking at about 12 cities, which we've identified as either developmental and maintenance. Those include uh, Midwest, Florida, and Northeast markets of Chicago, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Minneapolis, Detroit, uh, New York City, Philadelphia, Orlando, Jacksonville, Miami, Nashville, and Cincinnati. And then on top of this, uh, while we emphasize uh, digital coverage in our integrated markets, we can also utilize uh, digital marketing as a tool to really help us find those new markets uh, through behavioral targeting and programmatic targeting. So it's going beyond these 12 cities as well with, with our marketing reach. And then kind of looking at our, our core audience, um, who we're targeting in these markets. We are, of course, uh, targeting people who are likely to travel to Florida on vacation uh, with an interest in beach and arts and culture. Uh, we've identified different indicators of vibrancy. So audiences that are looking to have fun, uh, looking for a variety of activities, which is what we offer in our destination. Uh, curious, you know, maybe looking to try something different or something new. Uh, and then also excited, uh, not necessarily the thrill seekers, but people excited about uh, uh, the experiences that we have. And then on top of that, uh, with digital, we, we also look at um, travelers considering competitive destinations to try to think of uh, our destination in, instead or, or for the next time, uh, as well as um, you know if they've indicated interest in our destination. If, if there's someone from South Dakota who's looking for a Florida beach destination, we wanna make sure that we're bringing our message to that person, even if they're outside of that audience. So jumping into the digital tactics of this, and then I'll turn it over to Katie. Uh, we have a, a, a great number of, of, of digital tactics. I'll, I'll go over them pretty quickly, but again, please let me know if you have any questions. Um, at the top right of the screen, you can sort of see how we've identified the tactic as awareness um, in this case and as always on. So we have this running throughout the entire year. Um, and 
I'll just get started. So for, for YouTube, we've uh, been advertising on YouTube for, for a while. Last year, we did about 3.7 million views through paid and organic. Uh, this year, we're looking to emphasize uh, CTV, connected television spots, through YouTube to really get uh, some, some more engagement as we've seen people really watching YouTube on their big screen television. So that will be an emphasis for this year. Uh, Adgenuity is an advertiser that we use uh, for a number of different uh, opportunities, but we will be connecting with them on streaming television uh, across mobile uh, and website, uh, as well as TVs. And this year we'll, we'll really be leaning into, uh, and this is a theme you'll see throughout, utilizing our first party data more uh, and doing more video creative testing and really emphasizing as well uh, with, with greater emphasis on our integrated markets. Uh, last year we did about 8.4 million impressions across all locations. Uh, this is a new tactic that, that we're really excited about. Um, this is uh, Peacock and this is another streaming television advertising opportunity for us. Uh, this gives us the opportunity to explore a new platform. We also have unique ads that we can be running on this, like pause ads. So when people get up and pause the remote, they'll see a beautiful picture of our beaches uh, and think, I got to visit there. Uh, so we've contracted with 9.1 million impressions with, with NBC on this opportunity. Um, again, back to Adgenuity, this time with streaming audio, we will be running ad spots across uh, streaming uh, sources like Pandora, SoundCloud, Spotify. This is a tactic that we're bringing back from last year where we had about 7 million uh, ad spots run. This year, we are going to be targeting based on people's moods of what they're listening to. So this is pretty exciting for us to sort of target based on how they're feeling, um, something new for us. Uh, Atlas Obscura is another uh, new thing. We have advertised with Atlas Obscura uh, previously. However, this year we get the opportunity to uh, own an entire podcast episode of their number one travel podcast on Apple, which was a 2023 winner of best travel podcasts and generates 1.8 million monthly listens. Uh, we're, we're extremely ex the, the whole VSPC team is excited about this opportunity. Um, I just want to give a huge shout out to our team who does a lot of our social media legwork. I was running through the numbers uh, since this, this fiscal year, that 99 million impressions comes from over 2,800 posts. Most of that is done by a single person. So I really want to give credit to Jimmy from our social team who has been doing a lot of work uh, and really making our brand elevated uh, on social. Uh, Pinterest is an opportunity that we're coming back into with, with a new ad format. We've really seen that Pinterest has been something that a core group of, of travelers have used in their travel planning, and we had some great success this past year, uh, so we're expanding upon that success this year. Again, jumping back to ad genuity, uh, this is some of our display advertising. This year, we'll be leaning more into that competitive destination conquesting. Um, last year, we, we did about 16.4 million impressions. So w w if we didn't have a contracted amount, I just put in last year's numbers, just to kind of give you guys some perspective in terms of the reach on all these different opportunities. Um, Undertone, this is another ad unit that we've done a couple of times. Uh, this is really leaning now towards our engagement tactics, where we're getting people to not just uh, be exposed to our advertising, but we want people to interact. So this is an interactive ad unit. We'll be doing a creative refresh on this, uh, leaning into personalized content uh, for, for this advertising spot. And we have contracted 10 million impressions here. Uh, this is, again, another uh, new thing to this year. This is uh, mobile advertising targeting. Uh, we have some really unique units with this company called Tar uh, I'm sorry, Cargo. Uh, and, and some strong targeting capabilities. So we're, we're very excited to see what kind of ROI this, this will bring back to us. We, we expect good things. Uh, and this is running both in winter and summer. Again, back to Atlas Obscura. We're not just doing a podcast with them. We have a full suite of, uh, of a partnership with them that includes uh, additional entries into their Atlas. If you guys aren't familiar with Atlas Obs Obscura, they're, they're kind of this, um, I don't want to say dictionary, but... but um, um, almanac of, of very interesting places in the world, and they've really been growing quite a bit. So we have the opportunity to add in additional places this year, which is a permanent uh, addition. It doesn't go away with our marketing, and we're expecting about 9.8 million impressions through all the different advertising opportunities uh, with Atlas. 
Uh, Nativo is, again, another engagement opportunity where we actually have our content on a network of premium publishers. This year, we'll be adding a custom skin to that, um, and we're expecting 16.7 million impressions, which we've just seen really great uh, interest in this and people actually consuming the content. So uh, this is one we've, we've continued to bring back year after year. Uh, same with Sojourn. This is one of our low funnel tactics where this is actually driving more of the booking side of things, but this is uh, a display advertising uh, tactic. We are focusing more on the high performing native advertising and, and display advertising here. Um, but we, this is one of the ones where we really uh, know the return on our investment very closely here. Last year, we had 18 million impressions, uh, generating 5.4 thousand bookings and a 47 to 1 return on our ad spend through, through this unit alone. Expedia is another uh, conversion tactic. We will be advertising on Expedia, uh, and it will be always on next this, this year. Uh, what we're adding to that is a homepage component, but uh, we've, as you guys know, have, have traditionally had very great success on, on Expedia, as well as uh, TripAdvisor, which we will also be running this year, uh, expecting about 10 million impressions. And um, th this is a very interesting statistic that 50% of all travel purchase journeys involve a visit to tr TripAdvisor. So it's, it continues to be a very important source in uh, different travelers' booking journey. Uh, Hopper is a, is a very new uh, online travel agency. Um, they, they have kind of made some waves in this past year, and we're excited about participating in their Travel Deal, travel deal Tuesday happening after Thanksgiving. It's their number one sales day of the, of the year in November. Um, we had a great first campaign with them last year, so we're expecting uh, another solid campaign with this company. Um, and then lastly, from the digital side of things, is our Google search ads. This has been a bread and butter for us in our uh, digital advertising program. We've really made a big investment in not just um, doing the same thing each year, but um, staying at the top of what Google can do for us in terms of new advertising units and also integrating Google Analytics 4, which uh, rolled out this year, and so uh, generating some different conversion goals for this and seeing how we can uh, improve performance this year will, will be important for us. But as you see, we generate over 36 million impressions um, from uh, Google search. So overall, this plan has about $500,000 in negotiated ad value and savings. Uh, we have three new advertisers that we're working with this year, but 10 different tactics. Um, again, constantly kind of tweaking things, um, emphasizing really an increased level of personalization, expanding the use of our own data in our, in our advertising, and really increasing the focal point on conversion tactics to drive bookings. We know that um, you know, things have been a little bit down this year, so we wanted to make sure that we want to address that. Uh, we're supporting our integrated markets further on digital and, and really prioritizing the tactics that demonstrate a return on our investment. Thank you, Eddie. And I'm going to just share um, some of the traditional advertising. So in broadcast, <clears throat> broad, and that's, so that's like the broadcast uh, out of home billboards, radio. So um, this is a partnership we have with Visit Florida. Actually, um, are doing a lot with Visit Florida. Um, it's a, so this is a 60% investment on our side and 40% on Visit Florida's. Um, there are 30 second spots. It's our own brand creative, and we just include the Visit Florida logo at the end. Um, but it's a, uh, so it's dedicated 30 second spot, and this will start mid January. It's a four week campaign, and it is um, in several different markets, but I've highlighted the ones that are the ones that we're focusing on, and we will be, you know, be continuing more of those efforts. So it really aligns with our markets as well. And then following the Visit Florida campaign, we will um, continue running our, our ad spots, 30 second spots in our developmental markets. So Minneapolis, Detroit, uh, Chicago, Indy, and Atlanta. Um, and that um, will be uh, in Q1, running um, more television. And then also uh, looking at doing radio, starting um, in Q1, um, we're also um, in the markets, our developmental and our maintenance markets, which are highlighted there. So focusing on the high indexing station formats or NPR stations where we uh, will show, uh, provide an arts and culture message based on the NPR guidelines that they have. Um, working with some Spanish Latino stations where we will um, traffic a Spanish um, language spot. And then urban contemporary stations of uh, reaching our black audience uh, 
Um, and then we'll look to find some promotional partnerships. Um, for instance, uh, in November, uh, we are working with the, um, and we don't have a highlight on the map here, but New York City, uh, we are working with them for an iHeart, um, a Santa activation, which I'll get to you later. But it's a way of um, taking our radio by and adding some activation elements to it. Um, also, um, continuing our partnership with WESH, NBC, and Orlando, we've had this partnership since 2017. Um, we are contracted um, for the uh, first six months um, of, our, of our fiscal year. And this is where it's a beach cam. So um, in the morning news programs, um, they will come to you live from uh, Clearwater Beach, America's number one, one beach on uh, Florida's Gulf Coast. And so there'll be a recorded mention in our beach video. And then um, in the winter months when um, the news broadcast is dark outside, um, we'll have um, a TV, um, more like a branded spot that'll be running. And then new this year, um, we have negotiated with West to do a monthly contest program. So um, there would be our 10 second beach cam and then it would be immediately followed by a contest message for an opportunity for, um, for, listen, for viewers to um, go online to the West and enter um, to win a, win a trip or they can scan the QR code. And this is an opportunity we're putting forth as far our, for our co-op program um, that we're looking uh, to unveil um, early next month um, and sign up. So partners can participate by providing um, um, a stake certificate and then they would be promoted on WESH um, for, for um, a certain week in e each month. And then out of home, uh, continuing our billboard campaign, um, this will be in our developmental and our maintenance markets. And one thing that we're looking to do this year is to update the creative so that it's version to reach an audience at a certain time. So since these are digital billboards, we can change our message. So if it's um, running in a certain time in the morning, um, <clears throat> It's like a rise and shine message. Um, if or it's later in the evening, it's a sunrise, sunset, um, enjoying dinner kind of message. So um, we'll be working on our creative to, um, and then trafficking it to um, meet those certain day parts. Um, and again, developmental and maintenance markets. And we do um, uh, like a four week periods. Um, so in all markets, um, we have that running right now. Um, and then uh, starting, uh, we take a break over the holidays, just with all of the holiday clutter. We'll be back in uh, January in our maintenance markets. And there's a couple of examples of the creative. Let's rise and shine, so that would be in the morning. Um, and then sunset in the evening, let's follow the sun. And then print media. So um, as we shared in our, our strategy, we do, um, our audience does read. Um, magazines, and so we've uh, partnered with Visit Florida. These, the ones listed here, are Visit Florida co-op programs. So it does offer considerable savings when we can partner with them in these national pubs um, that re um, reach our audience. So you can see Garden and Gun, Magnolia, Condé Nast, Traveler, Bon Appetit, Afar. Um, we also work with the New York Times, uh, Sunday Magazine, and then uh, of course the Visit Florida annual magazine that they put out. And then we partner with um, some city magazines, so really focusing on the certain cities that we're advertising in. So we have Orlando Magazine, Hour, which is Detroit, and then the Indianapolis Monthly. Um, and these are the city magazines in our, our key markets. And then new this year is we're looking to do um, an integrated content series, so where we would bring down um, a writer from this group of publications to experience the destination and to write about their experience and really highlight some um, meaningful um, uh, people in our community um, to help per put together this content series that would um, align nicely with our, with our ads. And then we would be able to take this content and use it on our website and other, other areas. And then arts and culture, so um, continuing um, to put out arts and culture messaging with our campaign. Um, so we have Playbill, Art in America, Miami, which is a new, um, this one right there is the Art Basel publication. Um, so that will be um, coming out now for when Art Basel is in Miami in um, December. Uh, Flamingo, which is a Florida publication. And, um, oh sorry, I had this looked. Miami and then Art Basel, uh, Miami. 
And then reaching our LGBTQ audience. So um, Passport, um, which is a national LGBTQ publication, running advertising in there. And then Lavender, uh, which is uh, one of the top um, LGBT publications based in Minneapolis, um, and, and running uh, LGBT creative there. And then also working with Rolling Out. Um, this is a publication in Atlanta and in Chicago um, to target um, our, our black travelers. And then I mentioned um, earlier um, working with iHeart. So we will have a, a radio buy uh, with iHeart in New York City. Um, and it's during their holiday campaign. So um, they are the Delilah station. They are also the holiday music station. So everyone tunes in and listens to the holiday music. And we will be having ads running during that time period um, promoting um, our destination. And uh, working then as well with, the, um, with their pop pop-up event on December 3rd. Um, so iHeart um, every year hosts, um, it's the uh, Light FM 106.7 Skating in Central Park event. Um, and we've partnered with them in the past and we're, look and we're looking forward to going back over there with them. There's, they're a great team. They really um, it, understand uh, St. Pete Clearwater and they're, they're so happy about promoting us. So um, we'll be, uh, have an activation. Um, Craig and his team will be up there. We'll have a Santa experience so people can take their photo with Santa. Um, they can spin our wheel, uh, wheel for opportunities to win prizes. And then we'll be doing a trip giveaway. So it's a, it's a cool opportunity um, to extend our radio campaign that we have with them to do an uh, on-site activation with their team. And then continuing this year, working with influencers. Um, so one idea that we um, are working on is working with airline partners and, and, and doing um, hosting influencers from key cities um, that they're looking to bring people in. And we will uh, host them in our destination. And it's a combined um, opportunity to promote the direct service from, from on that airline and then what we have in our destination. So um, this is something um, we look forward to working with our airline partners on. And then also continuing to host influencers in market. Um, so uh, we've, we are, I've talked about this in the past. We have a program called Live Like a Local, and um, where we host uh, influencers in our destination. We um, hook them up with experiences, and then they post about them, and they get great following and engagement. And we're able to use those relationships to create content. So. Um, uh, Jimmy on our team will go out and shoot photos, and then we have rights to those photos, so we can use them in our advertising, and it's a really great partnership. So we've identified some potential storylines. Um, so I'm um, hosting an art lover, a music guru to come visit the sound, other great music spots, um, bringing them out to our elite events um, to experience the destination, to um, talk about all the great events in our destination, and um, hosting beer influencers. So. Um, that's something we look forward to continuing to bring in some new influencers to help spread the message. And then I just want to touch base on our international marketing real quick. Um, we continue to um, work with Brand USA. Um, they are um, the you know, national agency for promoting uh, USA um, uh, across the globe. So we are working with them um, in the in the markets of Canada, UK, Latin America, and Central Europe um, to put together. Um, programs um, that will reach uh, travel agents, direct to consumer marketing. Um, and it, Brand USA kind of has three different programs. One is like their originals, the Brand USA originals. So they're programs that they've created um, that partners can participate similar to our co-op, um, but they offer incredible value. Um, then there's affinity programs, which is um, like working with Expedia or other programs where if you do international marketing with, um, with those um, vendors you can get savings and then also general media so working with um, our team has relationship with tour operators we could work directly with them and brand usa will help um, upweigh the cost so it's a great relationship um, and we're continuing to work with them this year and really um, amp up those efforts in our international markets so um yeah we'll take any questions thank you very much thank you katie uh mayor Bruchowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of things. Thank you. Extensive presentation. Appreciate it all. I know you guys work really hard at what you do. Um, just a couple of things. So we know from the data that you provide, and you'll be talking about that later, but the data that you provide to us um, annually, 
um, that we have a huge drive market here, driving market. And so I'm just curious as to maybe why we're, um, if we've considered and if we have, why we're not um, advertising in Southern living and coastal living, because those are huge Southern markets and they are drive markets to here. And they're top in their class. I'm assuming it has to do with money, but. Yeah, um, we have looked into Southern Living and it's a good publication. It meets, meets our target audience. Unfortunately, Visit Florida doesn't have a direct um, partnership and we do look at it as a national pub, even though their they're no, concentration is more. So, um, but that's something we'll continue to look at. And well, and coastal living. I mean, we are the coast. So I just, I just feel like that's a big miss on our, on our side um, because of the kind of audience it has. You know, we're more West Coast Florida than East Coast. We're not Key West. We're not trying to be Key West. I mean, this is, a, and let's look at the number of cars we got coming in here from tourism. So I think those two things, I'd like to hear more about how we can possibly create our own partnerships or give it, get Visit Florida to do that. Um, and then the other thing, you talked about the, inter, the international part. Um, I'd also like to see us do some more branding at the Jays Stadium in uh, Toronto. Um, I, I tried to work out something, but it was a little bit too late this year. I mean, you know, we make our annual trip just like Clearwater and the county make their trip to Philly. And there was nothing there representing um, Visit St. Pete Clearwater. And Canada is one of our top international markets. And we have a, you know, a new, well, not so new anymore agreement that should allow you to have marketing there. And especially when we make this trip, um, I think we could be doing giveaways. I mean, we certainly should have a, some kind of a um, kiosk or something. Because let me tell you, when I wear my Dunedin shirt in, they know how to say it. They, not, they don't call it Dunedin. They know who we are because of spring training being here. Um, so I, I think that's a real missed opportunity. Yeah, um, we, yeah, we enjoy working with the, the Blue Jays folks. Um, per the agreement that we have with the stadium, we do have, um, uh, it's more television viewership rather than yeah. in-stadium assets. So um, uh, on the home plate, you would, our logo, we get a half inning of our uh, logo for home plate, but you have to see it, you have to see it on TV for that. Um, so yeah, that's, those are some opportunities we continue to can. can yeah, and you, you should see the number of people that go into that stadium. You know, for those who don't know, it is the only baseball team in the entire country of Canada. So they have sellout days. They have 40 some thousand seats and they're full, except for the nosebleed, which is really way up. Um, so I'm just saying, I, I think there's a real opportunity for people to just see that brand name. Um, and if you need any help connecting with them, feel free to reach out. Right, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think you guys do an excellent job. Katie, your team, Eddie, your team. I think it's worth underscoring. You, you know, advertising and marketing, we've got almost $16 million uh, budgeted. Um, digital, $6 million. And you were very responsible with those Fed tax dollars. And you took, in the previous presentation, it should be um, stated again that you took that fall winter campaign and spent, what was it, uh, six and a half million dollars, and we got a return on our investment of $41.20 for every dollar that you bought in media, um, which brought in $165 million in direct generated spending in our market. So I applaud you and thank you, and I don't, I don't think um, people may have glossed over that, but that's a very important part of how responsive we are with our, our um, bed tax dollars, so thank you. Anyone else? Anybody? Thank you again for your very excellent presentation. And I just want to say I totally agree with Mayor Bujowski on the comments she made about the Blue Jays and that stadium up there. It is absolutely an experience to be there and feel the energy in that stadium. 
You're welcome. Just FYI. Okay. Thank you so much, Eddie and Katie. And now we are on to Brian. Beach Renourishment, one of our favorite subjects. Before we get to Beach Nourishment, Eddie's going to stay up there, and he is going to hit the, she, he's going to go through uh, very swiftly and hit the high notes of the destination metrics. I, certainly. I, I will. In the next five minutes. <laughs> very quick. Uh, okay, so uh, really, you know, there, there's there's an overall theme of this, this past summer where, um, you know, we, when we look at our numbers, by themselves, you know, it's it's never great to see negative occupancy or, or negative ADR, but when we look at it in comparison to everything else that's going on, we, we really actually do feel good about our situation. And something that um, Allegiant brought up earlier was was balance, and I feel like uh, it's very true of, of our destination, but then of the entire Tampa Bay area. It has good balance, so when we do have tough times, we're kind of buoyed by that. Um, so we're looking at State of American Traveler sentiment. Uh, this is a survey each month of about 4,000 um, through, you know, different segments of the United States. And really, the, the overall theme here is that um, sentiment generally isn't, isn't great. It's not as, in 2023, it, it wasn't as high as it was in, in 2022 uh, in terms of whether or not now is a good time to travel. However, when we look at the future sentiment of travel, we, we're seeing a, an upswing, kind of in a growth in that. So we people are feeling better about the f future than they are about uh, the current state. When we um, talk about, or, or and this is actually done by future partners as well, so I do want to give them a shout out, but uh, when we look at the expected uh, travel spend, you know, really since April, that, that's kind of been down from the two-year average that we're looking at of about $4,000, yeah, $4,000, but it, it did take a tick back up in August, so that's some good news for us to, to see. And then excitement about travel really just continues to grow and, and has been growing. It's, it still maintains high. People are very excited to be traveling, um, regardless of their financial situation. So looking at us in contrast to sort of the other Florida destinations, this is just a look at our data to kind of quickly go through. We did see a dip in occupancy. Uh, and this the occupancy tends to be um, more dramatic than room rate or, or um, than for our market because we do have a greater amount of supply in the market than we had last year. So we did have a, a decrease of occupancy in about 3.8 percent, a small decrease of ADR of about 2.1 percent. Um, the demand is similar to that uh, room night number uh, at negative 1.8 percent, and then in terms of revenue, um, you know, about minus 3.9 percent. And this is from hotel occupancy data. So when we look at that in comparison to the the rest of the state, we can really kind of see that we're in line with where the state of Florida is doing, and slightly better than some of our competitive destinations like Orlando. Um, uh, 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 Palm Beach County um, and, and in line with uh, Miami and, and the Florida Keys. When we look at the average daily room rate, again, we're about in line with the state of Florida, but we're doing better than Miami, than uh, the Florida Keys, than or um, a couple of those other destinations that have that higher room rate. So you can kind of look at that 150 number. And generally, um, destinations that had an average room rate uh, below that typically did a little bit better, whereas the ones higher than that um, saw a little bit more of a decrease. And then looking at the revenue per available room, right in line with the state of Florida, um, obviously not a great number. And we see that Hillsboro throughout this data has, has been doing quite well, but I think that's to our benefit. Um, it, it, it's kind of helping us uh, do a little bit better than, than Miami, than, than Florida Keys, than Orlando, as, as you see those uh, took bigger hits. When we're looking at um, ourselves compared to where we were last year, uh, we are still doing strong compared to last year. We have, um, as of one month to go, about 92.8 million in uh, collections year to date of, of this fiscal year, uh, over 90.3 million. So that's about a, a, a 2.5 million buffer um, from last year. And, and I'm not, uh, you know, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I, I feel really good about where we will be uh, coming into next month. 
and kind of looking at all the different cities, this, this is an eyesore to kind of look like, to look at, but one of the themes that we'll sort of see here as we go through this data is generally um, beachfront properties had the hardest sort of hit uh, this summer, whereas inland properties actually did pretty well, and we kind of see that um, balance again in our destination. This is looking at just the inland hotel data. We only see a slight dip in our occupancy, and the room rate is actually above where we were last year at 4.7%, <coughs> with revenue per available room uh, increased at 3.8%. This is a sample from 67 properties uh, with just over 8,500 rooms. Looking at the beach side of that data, and again, this is all from STR, uh, we see a decrease much more dramatic of 7.3% in occupancy, a decrease of uh, slightly less dramatic, but 5.7% in, in room rate, and an overall decrease in, in revenue per available room. Don't even want to say that number, uh, but this is sampling from 43 properties, uh, nearly 7,000 rooms uh, of data. Looking at what's kind of coming out in the future and, and where we are, you, you can kind of see this crescendo. We've, we're expecting, and this is coming from CoStar uh, data source exclusively, but you, you kind of see this. Uh, we've got one property we're expected to uh, be, be opening in 2023, uh, two in 2024, three in 2025, and then it jumps up to five in, in 2026. So total, we have about uh, just over 2,000 rooms that are either proposed or currently under construction. On the right side of this, you see uh, the rooms that are currently under construction and where they are and what uh, year they're expecting to be built. Um, so we have six uh, properties total right now that are under construction and, and another 10 proposed uh, projects that we see through this hotel pipeline data. Uh, looking at it a little bit of a different way, we see um, upper scale, mid scale luxury properties kind of taking up um, probably over about 60% of that, and then economy and mid-scale making up the rest. And then looking at it sort of by area, we see St. Pete Beach with over half of those properties, but other destinations represented as well, Clearwater, St. Pete, Madeira Beach, Dunedin, Tarpon Springs, all have something that are either under construction or have something proposed. Jumping to our vacation rental side of things, um, and just kind of looking at uh, uh, what this data looks like, we're still seeing a positive growth in uh, rate over where we were last year, according to key data, but we are seeing a, a decrease in occupancy. And I just do want to uh, encapsulate, we did, we're, we're dealing with Adelia a little bit in this data, and we'll probably deal with it a little bit in September as well. So that, that you know, is an unfortunate thing that, that I think the numbers would have been stronger had we not had that uh, event kind of come through. Um, I did add to, to this, uh, the, the check-ins in hundreds, as well as the average stay value to kind of give you guys, um, you know, some additional perspective on the vacation rental side of things. And then looking at our visitor profile data, um, this, this kind of, there, there's not too much surprising that, that I haven't previously really shared with you guys. We are still seeing um, some decreases in, in daily spending, but again, this is consistent kind of with I think times being a little bit tough for people to um, do a luxury uh, uh, vacation, and there's also pent up demand elsewhere in places like Europe that might sort of be driving uh, those visitors temporarily uh, to to that destination. Um, but we do see, uh, in general, um, a little bit longer length of of stay, and I do want to call out that this is uh, incorporating the day trippers and the overnight. Uh, visitors, we uh, looked at the data without the day trippers recently and looked at the historical data. Um, and it really, it really hasn't changed too much year over year, but for just overnight visitors, we, we see about 5.5 nights in market and about six days. And moving forward, we'll start reporting that as, as the number removing the day trippers from that figure. Um, we are seeing a little bit more drive traffic uh, in our um, overnight visitors as well as inner day trippers. So we, we saw in August people driving more to the destination than, than previously. Um, not not in a crazy amount, but I do kind of want to wrap things up because I know we have more to get through. Um, so, you, you know, this data is pretty, pretty consistent with the traveler sentiment that we saw at the start, which is people want to travel, they want to come to our destination. We're still seeing visitor volume, but they're looking for ways to 
um, cut some costs uh, here and there. Any, any questions? Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Eddie, nice report. Thank you. Um, what's your thoughts on why Hillsborough was outperforming Pinellas with average rate and with rev bar? We've seen some enthusiasm about travel, not just in um, Tampa, but like other um, urban centers and an enthusiasm to travel to uh, cities. Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm sure that future partners could, could support because it's something that we've been looking at through their State of the American Traveler survey. So, so that's part of it, as well as Hillsborough's much lower room rate. Um, we're thinking that, you know, if people are trying to save a little money, maybe they're looking to um, stay a little bit further away from the beach, come to the beach, and then, you know, save, save money that way. So th that's, that's certainly part of it. And, and because Hillsborough really has that row, low uh, room rate, they were still able to grow uh, that, that amount, you know, when the rest of the state wasn't. Um, you know, it might be interesting to look at what Hillsboro is doing from a, from a sales and marketing standpoint and overlay that over what we're doing and find if there is anything that is uh, different, uh, productive, um, that we may be able to mimic. Yeah, I, I, great point. You know, I think um, capitalizing on events is really a point of emphasis for us to moving forward. We've got so many, like, just outstanding things uh, down the pipeline. So, you know, even uh, tomorrow, we've got a, a talent shoot scheduled with, you know, some, some folks from the WWE so we can promote the Royal Rumble and really capitalize on the, the buzz going around major events, which is something that I think Tampa has done a great job of, as well as, you know, they, they have um, a, a lot more beating conference space than us. So when that sort of starts to come back, which it, which it has, we have seen that uh, begin to come back, even for us, um, that, that obviously can help fill their room nights, and so it's something that we need to figure out how can we incorporate those strategies in our destination as well. Great. And then just to follow up, um, thank you so much for the, uh, the pipeline information. This is always helpful. I'm not familiar with the Alonic Hotel. Where is that located? I, yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I don't know. Does anyone know? Katie? Thank you. I didn't hear one word that she said. It, it's the new Opal Sands pro product that's going to be across the street. The expansion of Opal Sands Clearwater. on Clearwater Beach. How about that? Thank you so much. Oh. Mayor Bojowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. <clears throat> we know that um, European travel or out of the country travel is increased significantly. Um, some of this I think we, we see in our numbers. What, what are we doing to address that? I will presume that that's going to carry over into next year, knowing how long it takes us to, not just us, anybody, to react and get a campaign and figure out what the right idea is to combat it. But what are we going to do to become competitive with people who want either European travel or to get, well, combat that, to get those people to come back. Yeah, um, you know, I'll be honest, that's not something that we've really yet discussed. So, so, you know, that's something that we need to look at and figure out, you know, how to address. In, in my community, I'm hearing a lot about that, how, um, you know, it, it went from no travel during COVID to driving travel um, to anywhere an airplane will go within the country, and now it's everybody's going to Europe somewhere. Yeah, I mean, you know, looking at um, what they're what they're interested in, you know, for for some of those, uh, some people want that trip to Europe because they haven't been able to to make it for a few years. I mean, I know certainly my my in laws are in kind of that uh, uh, boat. And I don't know if there's anything that we could do to convince them. However, you know, it does, um, it, it does sort of just, we, we do have a growing number of luxury products and you sort of saw in the hotel pipeline kind of that um, upper scale product coming to our destination. So, you know, I think emphasis on that, emphasis on 
um, what what assets about a European vacation people are really enjoying. So whether that's get you know focusing more on uh, getting out on the water, for example, on on some of our like catamaran tours or or things like that, you know, really trying to maybe elevate uh, the perception of our destination in some people's minds. Um, but that you know this is this is all um, stuff we haven't really talked about internally yet. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Henderson and then Mr. Williams. Thank you for splitting up the overnight. <laughs> Knowing it's five to six days instead of two point whatever. And the other thing is interesting, I think 76% out of state for July. Um, that's, that's great. We've been led to believe that so much was coming down the I-4 corridor, I thought that number would be quite a bit lower, but uh, if we're still attractive in July, it'd be interesting to see what August looks like. Yeah. Thanks. Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Eddie, just another follow-up question, and this might go to um, some of the sales folks as well. Um, uh, we've talked before about the importance of international inbound travel and what we're doing to um, to solicit that and to market ourselves um, specifically to Western Europe. Um, we do have good airlift coming out now uh, into, into the area. Uh, happy to know that we've got a, a contingent going to World Travel Mart, I believe, next month. Um, but we can't underestimate the importance of, of um, growing that segment of our, of our travel public. Um, it's one where I think we have great opportunity and um, I, I'm, I'm not seeing the financial commitment to it in what we're spending um, to grow that, that Western Europe inbound business. Yeah, um, I, you know, I will say we, we have, uh, I believe, Daryl from our team over, uh, uh, at least in the UK at this moment right now, from our leisure travel standpoint. I know um, Jason, our, our new PR director, has some international travel booked uh, as as well, um, and Katie and, and Carmen with with BVK have uh, begun to really formulate our, our international marketing plan, um, which they captured some of the details there. But uh, yeah, international marketing certainly is is the biggest, you know, one of the biggest points of of emphasis in in our in our marketing kind of growth. Um, you know, uh, along with perhaps maybe the, the western part of the United States where we're starting to see a lot more visitation as well. Um, and, of course, certainly Canada as well. You, you know, that's, that's huge, as well as Latin America. So there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunity out there to, to bring folks uh, uh, to our destination. Mike, I, I'll just add right now, I think it's important to note that we're currently, the plan that they have in place and how we're operating today is based on a budget um, that was that was. Um, adopted um, last month, and the planning went into that in advance uh, earlier in the year. Um, I can promise you uh, that there's going to be an increased focus um, on those international markets. Um, for instance, we have representation, full-time representation in both the UK uh, and Germany today. We don't have that full-time, we don't have any representation uh, on the ground in South America. Um, we don't have, we've heard Canada, uh, Toronto come up today. We don't have any representation in the Canadian market. Um, that's because of dollars that were allocated or were not allocated in the past. Um, there's going to be um, a, a request to bring forth additional dollars, and we're going to invest more in those international markets moving forward. Um, may I suggest that now that we are under new leadership, that I ask you to take a look at that budget and see given the direction that the board is trying to move in and the opportunities that present themselves if maybe there shouldn't be some adjustments in that budget we can always do an amendment and um madam chair i would say that that's a focus of mine uh, i know that yeah. i have the confidence and the um, support from county administration. Um, they're aware that uh, I'm evaluating that and will be bringing something forward, but it's incumbent upon uh, me to put together the case um, to present to um, the Board of County Commissioners to do that, but uh, stay tuned. Thank you. Happy to hear that. A, a comment, if I can, to follow up with Mike's uh, question. Uh, last week there was a uh, leisure show case in uh, Vancouver. We had somebody there, and they, the uh, European operators that were there, 
are talking about 24 and 25 that the market is to finally starting to move. And so our timing to look at the budget and everything is exactly now um, on it. And uh, so that's that was a comment out of the leisure show that was in Vancouver. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, now we will hear from our president and CEO, Brian Lowack. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to give a quick update. Um, this is something new that we're going to, uh, moving forward, it's going to be a standing item on the agenda um, until further notice. I want to make sure to provide um, a monthly update on beach nourishment. That is our number one issue. I know it's on the minds of each and every one of us. Um, so today I'm going to start with a quick um, update on the current emergency dune restoration project occurring along the coast. Um, uh, Barry alluded to this earlier. Uh, after Adelia, um, our dunes did their job. They held up to the storm and combated the surge and the winds and protected our coastal communities. However, they took a severe hit. Uh, many of them were wiped out. The ones that remain uh, were severely damaged. Um, so the board authorized some emergency funding um, out of the tourist development tax collections to go ahead and move forward on an emergency project. Um, so the current timeline, and uh, the reason you don't have uh, this in front of you is because this is changing on a daily basis, and I want to make sure you had the most up to date. So this is as of this morning. Um, the current projects include uh, Sunset Beach and Treasure Island, Paso Grill and St. Pete Beach, Bel Air Beach, and Upham Beach. Um, all four of those segments are underway currently, and they will begin wrapping up. The first one is anticipated to conclude on October 28th, and the last one um, that's currently underway is scheduled to wrap up on November the 19th. The next, I'm looking out at the horizon, the next segment of beach that will be included in this project will be Indian Rocks Beach. Um, I want to also um, point out that the county public works has stood up a dedicated web page um, for um, uh, our public's um, knowledge, and this includes, it's, it's updated on a daily basis. It's got an interactive map to show you down to the beach access point uh, and the avenue uh, on which one's closed, which one's open, where work's going, and where they're going next. Um, and then also I want to let you know that um, after this, um, I'm, we're going to try to get through the rest of this meeting so we can uh, get down to our, we have media availability uh, down in Treasure Island today at 1 p.m. at the Sunset Beach Pavilion. Uh, Dr. John Bishop, the county's coastal management coordinator, uh, Lauren Dewing, the county's environmental specialist, and myself will be available um, for the media to answer questions and provide an update on that project. And then um, I also want to take this opportunity just to remind everyone watching, and hopefully you will carry this away from this meeting uh, and relay this to the community, that folks need to stay off those dunes that are under construction. Um, they, uh, we, we have had some folks that are, are going out there, they're walking through um, beach access points that are closed, they're walking through dunes, they're um, really messing up the dune system. They're not even completed yet. The first pro process is they put the dunes in place, they build them. Those are those dump trucks you've seen. Once they do that and they've got them constructed, they then do plantings with vegetation. And those vegetations have to grow roots in order to uh, maintain the integrity of those dune systems so they can perform. And if we've got folks out there trampling them before they even have vegetation planted and they're complete, um, it's, it's all for nothing. So please uh, take that away from this and carry that message along. And then last and but not least, I do want to give you an update. Carrying on with our From Visitors With Love campaign, um, uh, I, I've said it and basically every, everyone I've talked to, I've, I've given a shout out to that campaign and we'll continue to do so. But we wanted to uh, make sure that we uh, capitalize on this situation and we're going to be installing um, from visitors with love signs uh, at beach access points to make sure residents and visitors know um, that our visitors who come down here and pay the bed tax, they're the ones that uh, pay for uh, those white sandy beaches that we get to enjoy, those dune systems that are being constructed today. And we wanna make sure that that message is out there to not only our residents, uh, but also visitors. So um, I look forward to seeing those out there. They're huge, they're gonna be at the beach access points. Uh, I promise you, if you go to a beach access, you won't be able to miss it. Um, and that's my update on the beach nourishment. Brian, okay. question oh, if I could. Um, the website for Public Works. 
Yes. Yeah, so it's rather than give you all the, you know, backslash this, backslash that, it's if you go to the PinellasCounty.gov, uh, right on the homepage, there is a banner uh, for the emergency dune uh, repair project. It'll take you right there. Um, and also, if you just do what I did and Google um, Pinellas County um, dune project, beach project, uh, it'll take you right to it. And we also have that linked on uh, Visit St. Pete Clearwater page as well. Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Brian, any update on uh, ongoing discussions with the Corps of Engineers? Yeah, so I will, um, I'll give you a high level update on that. We do have a team of um, outside support uh, with uh, not only our lobbying teams, uh, but also our consultants um, who are working multiple angles uh, at the federal level. We do have uh, legislation that's been introduced uh, both in the, in the Senate side and the House side um, that would address um, the easement issue that we're having, uh, that will go and hopefully make it into a uh, WERDA 2024 bill. Uh, we're in 2023 now, so that's a ways out. Uh, but that would be um, a solution that would completely eliminate our issue. It, it essentially says that you, the Corps can't do what they're doing now um, uh, to hold up a project. In the interim, there is uh, some legislation that was included in uh, last year's WERDA package um, that uh, Senator Scott and Rubio introduced and was passed that required the Army Corps of Engineers to evaluate the different easement um, uh, policies and requirements that they have in place and provide an updated report to Congress uh, by the end of this year. We've got a team that's working directly with the Army uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Army's office um, to make sure that our voice is heard and reflected in that report that will be uh, going to Congress. And then additionally, we do continue to, um, I believe we've got a delegation uh, of Pinellas County folks going to the um, uh, Washington next month to speak to <coughs> committee staff uh, on the Hill um, to make sure that the folks in Washington who aren't here in Pinellas County and haven't been to the beach, they know the concerns that we're talking about and we can give them a real perspective of what's occurring on the ground. Thanks, Brian. Anyone else? Mayor Gaddis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first off, I'd like to thank uh, you and the entire Board of County Commissioners for uh, moving quickly on this project. Uh, I believe that after we met with the Army Corps uh, and received the bad news, um, everyone did the right thing. And, uh, and it's, it's a huge blessing for all of our beach communities that are, uh, are receiving this uh, dune replenishment. Uh, I would also like to commend Kelly Levy, who is doing a great job of co uh, coordinating it all. I don't know if Gator Dredging is doing all of the project or if it's just our area, but I will say that they've been very forthcoming with information uh, as soon as we got the word, we met with them three days later um, after receiving, we had to get temporary easements, uh, construction easements that were not included in the original easements that were signed. Uh, we we uh, received those five easements and uh, immediately met. And I think part of the reason why we're having so many people that are on the dunes is because the construction started so quickly, we really didn't have the opportunity to get the word out and explain what's going on. Now that the uh, accesses are closed, we're having trespassers crossing private property to get on the beach. Uh, it's just my opinion, but I think that uh, what would uh, help this project until the uh, vegetation uh, has taken full root, I, it would be nice if we could um, maybe step up beach patrols uh, from the Sheriff's Department uh, to keep an eye on things because they're not going to stay off of those dunes. They, they will not stay away. There's, uh, it's, it's nearly impossible to stop them. Uh, so uh, it's a great job. Uh, what's happening, uh, we're very truly grateful and, uh, and I appreciate your efforts. I uh, only hope that we can continue moving forward and, uh, and get everyone protected. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? 
Anyone else? No? Okay, we're going to move on to uh, comments and board member comments and discussion, but I would like to take the liberty of delivering my comments now before we get to the board comments, if that's okay with you, since I deferred them from the beginning of our meeting. So um, <clears throat> I feel a very urgent uh, desire to correct the record with regard to a lot of the misinformation and miscommunication that has been talked about since uh, I sent a couple of weeks ago a white paper to all of you about an idea that I thought was worthy of a very good discussion at this at this, with this group. Uh, since I did not have an opportunity to have that discussion with all of you, I would like you to uh, accept an opportunity from our new president and CEO at a later date to hear some of the information that I had been prepared to bring forward to this board that I learned while I was on my trip to the travel show in San Antonio. I thought it was my responsibility to come back from that show and share the information with all of you that I had learned there, uh, but I did not have an opportunity to do that, and so I passed the information on to Brian. He is very aware and I hope that you will take the opportunity to, to listen to what it is that I did learn because the most important thing that I learned from the information there is that the world is changing and direct marketing organizations throughout our state and our country are changing the ways in which they, we operate to accommodate the changes that are going on in the world. And so I'm kind of really looking forward to the big travel show in London because there, I venture to say, we both will come back with some other new ideas that we will feel compelled to share with you. And because there's a desire to share information from other places that we've been and opportunities that we've had does not mean that we're trying to dictate any kind of a mandate or changes here or whatever it is all that you have begun to think about what my intention is. Because I assure you, if you're not aware of those things, you'll make mistakes. And you have an obligation as members of this board to be up to date on the newest and greatest information that's out there. So that's all I want to say about that. But I do think this organization would be very well served to hear what Mr. Roger Dow, I think most of you probably know who he is, and I had hoped that he would be here today. But as you can see, he's not. But, you know, he did represent this industry nationwide. And he has kept his fingers on the pulse of what's going on in the industry. And I think you would be well served to hear it. And that's all I'm going to say under my comments. So let's open it up to board comments. And we'll start with whoever wants to go first. Well, now, surely you're not all going to be silent. You I'm are. going. Yes, Mr. Just Henderson. I just want to congratulate Brian on uh, his uh, appointment as the official CEO, president and CEO of our organization. Uh, you're doing a great job so far. I like the one-on-ones that we had before. I think it's really productive. And uh, as you learn more, I think you're going to expand and, and do more in your position and as an administrator. And we'll be looking for that marketing guru to come down the pike that, uh, that uh, <clears throat> our county administrators promised we're going to find the best in, that we can, right? Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. I 
I think it goes without saying that every one of us could probably venture a few kind words about Brian and how excited we are for him and hopeful for his future and to find out how he leads us over the next however many years you're here. So congratulations from myself personally, but I've already said that to you anyway. Anyone else? Mr. Williams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Brian and I, too, uh, think we've got the right man for the job at the right time. Um, and I, uh, I know you're gonna do, you're gonna do great things. Um, I think you're, you've got great experience and as you continue to learn um, the travel industry, you're, you're going to be a valuable asset for the county. I, I will say, and, and I wanna make sure that my message is clear, I do believe you're the right person for the job and, and uh, it's worked out well. I will share with you though that I am disappointed in the process and how you were appointed. Um, you know, at, at one point we were told there was going to be an executive search firm that was retained and engaged. I believe it was Mike Campbell with, um, with Searchwide Global uh, that after an interim period we would, uh, we would look at that um, executive search and impanel a search committee. Um, I think it's, it, it was not right that this board, the Tourism Development Council, was not consulted um, prior to this appointment. Um, to my knowledge, the Board of County Commissioners were not consulted prior to your appointment. And, and I think uh, in the future, we need to be, we need to be part of that decision um, and not have that decision just communicated to us. We are the tourism, <clears throat> excuse me, we are the tourism professionals. Who best to know who the candidates are, um, who the right candidates are, and what skills and talents they need than us. And, and I think uh, while the outcome was wonderful, and I, uh, I'm so glad that you're in the role, I was deeply disappointed that the process wasn't followed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Further comments? Brian? So I, <clears throat> excuse me, I too would like to congratulate Brian, right man for the job, had a great relationship. Phillies are two games away from the World Series again, which will ring the cash register next March. They had the fourth largest attendance last February and March in their history, and I'm sure it's gonna be robust again next year. So congratulations to them, and uh, hopefully they win a World Series this year. Mayor Bolchowski. Yeah, my poor Jays are out of it now. <laughs> but anyway, congratulations. Hey, it, it's somebody from our region, so that's what I'm happy about. Um, I, I too want to congratulate uh, Brian. Um, I do want to say that, I, well, Mike, I understand what you're saying. I do. Um, I won't tell you how, but I, I was consulted. I was asked how, how I felt about it. And I said I thought it was great because my biggest concern, which is going to be my question to Brian next, is, you know, who's going to be our vice president of marketing? Because in my mind, that's the most important position um, that we can get filled besides a really strong administrator. Um, I understand what you're saying. I do. I agree. I'm not sure we had time to wait. I, really, that's just my humble opinion. So maybe you can give us an update on your search for the vice president of marketing because I think that's our next critical step. Absolutely, and I will address uh, your question, but I also um, will address, uh, to some extent, uh, Mr. Williams' um, comment is talking about being part of the process. Um, uh, I have, uh, in, in going forward, and uh, we've already implemented it in our first, or, or excuse me, our second VP um, search process, um, and we will be doing that in our next two. Uh, VP search processes is that I have engaged um, uh, a, a panel to vet those candidates and interview those candidates um, that's been made up of, my, in addition to myself, 
one TDC member that I think can provide valuable expertise um, to that specific position, one industry um, expert professional um, who can provide um, who can contribute to that search and know what we're looking for, and then also one internal staff member who's currently um, uh, with the organization to provide their perspective and really dig into some of the specifics um, that are going to be required with the job. So um, I, that's my commitment to you is that um, in these VP searches, um, well, we will accommodate uh, folks on this board. I know some of you have already been involved in that and others are lined up to participate in that. And for those that have, I thank you. Um, as far as the update on the CMO position, uh, I'm happy to say that um, we do have uh, SearchWide uh, is, is uh, engaged for the CMO position, and that is out uh, right now um, being advertised, and they have started that process. I will be sending um, a link out to each of you um, that you can share with your networks um, to that job posting. And um, I, I will have an update every month uh, on the CMO position as well as the VP of Business um, Development. And you've got your person for two meetings. I do. You're, you're, yes, you're jumping the gun on me. Yes. Thank you. You want to talk about the person for the community? Uh, I, not at this point, but in and at, right after this, yes. Okay, Mr. Williams. Um, if I could just circle back, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanna circle back to your comments. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's many schools of thoughts on how best a, a DMO should work, um, what the oversight should be, how the governance should be. Uh, I think it's timely for us to listen to options. Um, with open minds um, to, to engage in discussion and debate. And uh, frankly, I, I heard that Roger Dow was going to be attending this meeting and I was disappointed to learn um, that he was not. Um, I've known Roger for years and years and he is a, uh, he's a true professional that has um, a global uh, viewpoint on travel and tourism and I think he can, he can add a lot to the discussion uh, and certainly put some ideas in our, in our minds that we should be considering as a tourism board. Um, so I, I, for one, would be in favor of a, of a session that we, we spend just on that debate. Um, we have so many other agenda items often to talk about, but uh, something as critical as that might need its own, its own meeting or own session. That's all I wanted to say. No comments? Nobody has a thought? <laughs> Mr. Prather. Thank you once again, Madam Chair. Um, just to reiterate, congratulations, Brian. I look forward to uh, next month when we get our monthly uh, meeting agenda that it doesn't say interim in front of your name. So hopefully that will scratch it off. So thank you and congratulations again. Anyone else? Well, this group is not usually so quiet. Uh, is there new business, Brian? Um, I, I would just say I, I've heard, you know, in in this um, discussion as far as some of the some of the models out there and some of the some of the improvements that can be um, possibly made to the organization. I think it's incumbent upon me uh, as the president and CEO of the organization to. Um, always be looking at improvements to make uh, within the organization. I can tell you uh, I am, I have been, um, and I think uh, outlined in the white paper, um, there were a number of um, things that were listed as pros um, uh, and things that maybe we wanted to explore that we um, have challenges with today. Uh, I will tell you we're, we're doing things uh, to address those um, today. I will continue to do things to address those. I think that um, one of the things um, that I've put together is, uh, and I plan to bring it to you next month uh, formally, but I have a marketing committee um, to make sure that we get uh, marketing professionals and outside eyes um, uh, included in our marketing strategies and our marketing efforts. Um, this committee would meet um, quarterly. It would, be, it would consist of 10 individuals um, from different 
tourism related and economic development uh, related segments of the entire county, um, both from leadership, but also from marketing professionals to make sure that we have their eyes and, and ears and thoughts included in um, everything that we do marketing. Um, I will also say um, there, you know, I, I can't underscore how important it is for the changes and to, and to you know, uh, finalize these uh, changes of the restructuring, um, for lack of a better term, of the organization. Um, we're doing that from both from the bottom up and hiring within the individual departments to make sure that each department has the support they need to effectively carry out their roles and responsibilities, but also from the top down and um, uh, bringing in these four VP positions. Uh, when I came on, um, on day one, there were 12 departments that reported directly to me, uh, and that's pretty overwhelming. Um, it, it, since that time, uh, we've got uh, First was Terry, the VP of Finance and Administration. Everything that we do involves finance, contracts, and administration. She now has, she's in a leadership role where she can focus on those uh, and, and make sure that we're moving in the right direction there, whether it's accounting, uh, contracts, CRM systems. The next one um, that I'm, I'm happy to, to talk to today, uh, or talk about today, is our VP of Community Engagement. Uh, one of the first things that I heard when I came into the organization, both from staff, but also from our partners within the industry, was that um, Visit St. Pete Clearwater has a, has a good relationship with our industry partners. It can be better. Um, we do provide a lot of information to our partners. We can provide more. Um, so that's why um, uh, we're proud to have our, our VP of Community Engagement and to really think strategically on how we can do some of those things that we've been doing. We've been doing well in the past, but um, those staff now have the support that they need um, to think long term on how to do that. And then in business development, we've got six departments that are sales related, business development related and they all do a great job at what they're doing, but they're focused on what they're doing. And so to bring in someone from uh, a VP of business development to over oversee and think strategically about how all those interact, how all of our incentive programs from the film commission to sports, to meetings, to leisure, and all the other folk, uh, funding programs involved with those to make sure they're integrated and that, that's gonna be huge. And then last it's been talked to today, the CMO position. Um, that is pivotal for the organization. And we have, uh, I I'm confident to say we've got the best um, person right now in our senior uh, marketing and advertising position that's in the business. Um, she is incredible. Um, she has been um, pulled in so many different directions because marketing and advertising is involved in every 12, each of the 12 departments that we have. Every contract we do, there's a marketing component. Uh, every deal we do, there's a marketing component. Every event we fund, there's a marketing component. So to be able to free up our, our uh, marketing and advertising team, um, our digital and data team, as well as our PR team and have someone come in and um, oversee all that in the CMO position will be huge. I can confidently say that we're in a better place today than we were four months ago, and we'll be in a better place four months from today than we are today. So um, um, those are my comments, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you've got. Questions, concerns, Phil? We want to introduce that new community engagement. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I do have a list of introductions today, and uh, I will um, uh, stop with the anticipation, but I would like to call up our, our newest member of our Saint, Visit St. Saint Pete Clearwater team, our uh, VP of Community Engagement, Kylie Diaz, um, to introduce herself to you all and just say a few words. Um, I'm, I believe most of you already know Kylie. She's been in the community. Um, I, um, as soon as that position was out there, um, I, I, I was getting, uh, folks were excited. Uh, she comes to us from uh, Clearwater Marine Aquarium, uh, where she oversaw tourism marketing. She also has experience in community engagement, activations, uh, marketing, and uh, she's involved in numerous uh, community boards and organizations. So uh, we couldn't be more proud to have Kylie as our second VP and part of our leadership team. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kylie uh, Diaz, 
As Brian mentioned, I join you from Clearwater Marine Aquarium. I have over 20 years of experience in uh, destination marketing uh, from New York to South Carolina and now here in our destination. Um, at Clearwater Marine Aquarium, I was in charge of advertising, tour operators, and all of the community engagement and partnerships. Um, during that time, we branded a hotel and had some other really great accomplishments. So I'm really excited to bring um, my knowledge and expertise to the destination. And I've already been working with many of you, um, and so I can't wait to continue that process. So thank you so much for welcoming me. Congratulations. <laughs> And um, while Kylie is the newest member of the Visit St. Pete Clearwater team, um, in between our last TDC meeting and this meeting, um, we also did um, our Director of Public Relations, Jason Latimer, um, officially came on board. I know Jason's here today. Jason, if you'd like to come up and just introduce yourself to the, the group, uh, Jason's uh, got an extensive uh, background in uh, PR, and he came in actually the week of um, the raise announcement. Uh, so we were able to uh, have him jump right in and he's excelled every day since he's been here. So Jason. Hi Brian, thank you. Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. I look forward to uh, working with everybody. I met as many of you as I could last time, uh, which was I think my second week on the job. Um, so uh, working real hard. Uh, we've got a great team. Uh, it's awesome to be a part of, of this and, and see, you know, Brian's vision and and see what we're being, what's being built here, and um, you know, welcome somebody you know so important to our community like Kylie. Um, so just looking forward to doing this. Like Brian said, I've, you know, I've been doing communications for more than 20 years, most of it in sports. Um, had a small stint here actually in government with the elections office, uh, but uh, you know, like just just really excited and and thrilled about you know what this destination has to offer, and hearing you know your feedback and what everybody was saying today and. Um, knowing that a lot of us are on the same line and thinking of what those opportunities are, you know, overseas in Europe and South America and Canada and even across the U.S. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Congratulations, Thanks, Jason. Jason. And then I have, if, if, if you don't mind, I do have, I do want to recognize two more folks that we have here with us today. These are our newest, uh, our two newest Visit St. Pete Clearwater uh, interns, um, and they can make their way up now. But we have Grace Flogger, uh, who's a first year grad student at the University of South Florida in the Vinick Sports and Entertainment Management Program. And joining her is Liam, Liam Downs, who's a senior at University of Tampa, and he's a marketing and digital media major uh, with a minor in entrepreneurship. So uh, please join me in welcoming them, and if they could say a few words about themselves. Uh Nice to meet you all. Like you said, like Brian said, thank you. Um, my name is Liam Downs. I'm a senior at the University of Tampa. Um, we're about a month into our internship. Uh, this has been my first experience in government. I couldn't be more proud uh, to work for a government who cares so much about its community and its people. And I look forward to growing with you guys as well as just learning more about <clears throat> the uh, St. Pete Clearwater area. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Grace Flogger, and I'm currently a graduate student at USF in the Vinick Sport and Entertainment Management Program. Um, I've also been here for about a month with Liam, and it's been a great experience just getting to know everyone, getting to learn all about you on the TDC and the BCC as well. Um, and then just learning and getting out there in the community. A big part of what I want to do in sports is community engagement and activation. So having the opportunity to do that has been amazing and just getting to learn more about what St. Pete and Clearwater has to offer. So thank you so much. And, and last but not least, I do want to give a shout out to our meetings and, and um, conferences team. They are not, you won't see them in the crowd today because they are all working. They're all over in uh, Las Vegas right now at their largest show of the year, IMAX. Um, so I, I don't know if they leave that, the, the inside of that convention center uh, when they go over there, um, but I, I know that they're, they're doing well. Um, I did want to recognize them. They were recently, just this week, awarded, notified that they were awarded with the 2023 Smart Meetings Magazine Platinum Choice Award. And this is um, determined by industry professionals and smart uh, meetings uh, readers. They cast votes and each nomination undergoes a thorough review from the Smart uh, Magazine's editorial team. 
and um, the winners will be recognized in the December issue of Smart Meetings Magazine's digital edition, and it's seen by 65,000 engaged meeting professionals. There will be a press release with global reach for several hundred media outlets. They'll be showcased on online for the next year on a special Platinum Choice Awards dedicated winner page, and they'll be featured in a dedicated online winners article um, that garners national media attention. So I, I know our meetings and conferences team is, is an extremely important part uh, of our organization. I make want to make sure that when they get recognized for their good work that we recognize them here. So thank you. Thank you, Brian. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is there anything else for the good of the order from the board members? Anyone? No? Okay, then we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.